Section 1 of Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Atlantis, the Antediluvian World by ignatius loyola donnelly the world has made such comet-like advance lately on science we may almost hope before we die of sheer decay to learn something about our infancy when lived that great original broad-eyed sunken race whose knowledge like the sea-sustaining rocks hath formed the base of this world's fluctuous lore. Festus Part 1. The History of Atlantis Chapter 1. The Purpose of the Book This book is an attempt to demonstrate several distinct and novel propositions. These are 1 that there once existed in the atlantic ocean opposite the mouth of the mediterranean sea a large island which was the remnant of an atlantic continent and known to the ancient world as atlantis two that the description of this island given by plato is not as has been long supposed fable but veritable history three that atlantis was the region where man first rose from a state of barbarism to civilization four that it became in the course of ages a populous and mighty nation from whose overflowings the shores of the gulf of mexico the mississippi river the amazon the pacific coast of south america the mediterranean the west coast of europe and africa the baltic the black sea and the caspian were populated by civilized nations five that it was the true antediluvian world the garden of eden the garden of the hesperides the elysian fields the gardens of alcanus the mesomphalus the olympus the asgard of the traditions of the ancient nations representing a universal memory of a great land where early mankind dwelt for ages in peace and happiness six that the gods and goddesses of the ancient greeks the phoenicians the hindus and the scandinavians were simply the kings queens and heroes of atlantis and the acts attributed to them in mythology are a confused recollection of real historical events seven that the mythology of egypt and peru represented the original religion of atlantis which was sun worship eight that the oldest colony formed by the atlanteans was probably in egypt whose civilization was a reproduction of that of the atlantic island nine that the implements of the bronze age of europe were derived from atlantis the atlanteans were also the first manufacturers of iron ten that the phoenician alphabet parent of all european alphabets was derived from an atlantis alphabet which was also conveyed from atlantis to the mayas of central america eleven that atlantis was the original seat of the aryan 
or indo-european family of nations as well as of the semitic peoples and possibly also of the terranian races twelve that atlantis perished in a terrible convulsion of nature in which the whole island sunk into the ocean with nearly all its inhabitants thirteen that a few persons escaped in ships and on rafts and carried to the nations east and west the tidings of the appalling catastrophe which has survived to our own time in the flood and deluge legends of the different nations of the old and new worlds if these propositions can be proved they will solve many problems which now perplex mankind they will confirm in many respects the statements in the opening chapters of genesis they will widen the area of human history they will explain the remarkable resemblances which exist between the ancient civilizations found upon the opposite shores of the atlantic ocean in the old and new worlds and they will aid us to rehabilitate the fathers of our civilization our blood and our fundamental ideas the men who lived loved and labored ages before the aryans descended upon india or the phoenician had settled in syria or the goth had reached the shores of the baltic the fact that the story of atlantis was for thousands of years regarded as a fable proves nothing there is an unbelief which grows out of ignorance as well as a scepticism which is born of intelligence the people nearest to the past are not always those who are best informed concerning the past for a thousand years it was believed that the legends of the buried cities of pompeii and herculaneum were myths they were spoken of as quote, the fabulous cities end quote. for a thousand years the educated world did not credit the accounts given by herodotus of the wonders of the ancient civilizations of the nile and of chaldea he was called the father of liars even plutarch sneered at him now in the language of frederick schlegel quote, the deeper and more comprehensive the researches of the moderns have been the more their regard and esteem for herodotus has increased buckle says his minute information about egypt and asia minor is admitted by all geographers there was a time when the expedition sent out by pharaoh necho to circumnavigate africa was doubted because the explorers stated that after they had progressed a certain distance the sun was north of them this circumstance which then aroused suspicion now proves to us that the egyptian navigators had really passed the equator and anticipated by two thousand one hundred years vasquez de gama in his discovery of the cape of good hope if i succeed in demonstrating the truth of the somewhat startling propositions with which i commence this chapter it will only be by bringing to bear upon the question of atlantis a thousand converging lines of light from a multitude of researches made by scholars in different fields of modern thought further investigations and discoveries will i trust confirm the correctness of the conclusions at which i have arrived end of section one
Section 2, Part 1, Chapter 2 of Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. Part 1, Chapter 2, Plato's History of Atlantis. Plato has preserved for us the history of Atlantis. If our views are correct, it is one of the most valuable records which have come down to us from antiquity. Plato lived four hundred years before the birth of Christ. His ancestor, Solon, was the great lawgiver of Athens six hundred years before the Christian era. Solon visited Egypt. Plutarch says, quote, Solon attempted in verse a large description, or rather fabulous account, of the Atlantic island, which he had learned from the wise men of Sais, and which particularly concerned the Athenians. But by reason of his age, not want of leisure, as Plato would have it, he was apprehensive the work would be too much for him, and therefore did not go through with it. These verses are a proof that business was not the hindrance. Quote, I grow in learning as I grow in age, end quote. And again, quote, Wine, wit, and beauty still their charms bestow, light all the shades of life, and cheer us as we go, end quote. Quote, Plato, ambitious to cultivate and adorn the subject of the Atlantic island as a delightful spot in some fair field unoccupied, to which also he had some claim, by reason of his being related to Solon, laid out magnificent courts and enclosures, and erected a grand entrance to it, such as no other story, fable, or poem ever had. But, as he began it late, he ended his life before the work, so that the more the reader is delighted with the part that is written, the more regret he has to find it unfinished. There can be no question that Solon visited Egypt. The causes of his departure from Athens for a period of ten years are fully explained by Plutarch. He dwelt, he tells us, quote, on the Canopian shore by Nile's deep mouth, end quote. There he conversed upon points of philosophy and history with the most learned of the Egyptian priests. He was a man of extraordinary force and penetration of mind, as his laws and his sayings, which have been preserved to us, testify. There is no improbability in the statement that he commenced in verse, a history and description of Atlantis, which he left unfinished at his death. And it requires no great stretch of the imagination to believe that this manuscript reached the hands of his successor and descendant, Plato. A scholar, thinker, and historian like himself, and, like himself, one of the profoundest minds of the ancient world. The Egyptian priest had said to Solon, quote, you have no antiquity of history, and no history of antiquity, end quote. And Solon doubtless realized fully the vast importance of a record which carried human history back, not only thousands of years before the era of Greek civilization, but many thousands of years before even the establishment of the kingdom of Egypt, 
and he was anxious to preserve for his half-civilized countrymen this inestimable record of the past we know of no better way to commence a book about atlantis than by giving in full the record preserved by plato it is as follows critias then listen socrates to a strange tale which is however certainly true as solon who was the wisest of the seven sages declared he was a relative and great friend of my great-grandfather dropidas as he himself says in several of his poems and dropidas told critias my grandfather who remembered and told us that there were of old great and marvellous actions of the athenians which have passed into oblivion through time and the destruction of the human race and one in particular which was the greatest of them all the recital of which will be a suitable testimony of our gratitude to you socrates very good and what is this ancient famous action of which critias spoke not as a mere legend but as a veritable action of the athenian state which solon recounted critias i will tell an old world story which i heard from an aged man for critias was as he said at that time nearly ninety years of age and i was about ten years of age now the day was that day of the apaturia which is called the registration of youth at which according to custom our parents gave prizes for recitations and the poems of several poets were recited by us boys and many of us sung the poems of solon which were new at the time one of our tribe either because this was his real opinion or because he thought he would please critias said that in his judgment solon was not only the wisest of men but the noblest of poets the old man i well remember brightened up at this and said smiling yes yes aminander if solon had only like other poets made poetry the business of his life and had completed the tale which he brought with him from egypt and had not been compelled by reason of the factions and troubles which he found stirring in this country when he came home to attend to other matters in my opinion he would have been as famous as homer or hesiod or any poet and what was that poem about critias said the person who addressed him about the greatest action which the athenians ever did and which ought to have been the most famous but which through the lapse of time and the destruction of the actors has not come down to us tell us said the other the whole story and how and from whom solon heard this veritable tradition he replied at the head of the egyptian delta where the river nile divides there is a certain district which is called the district of sais and the great city of the district is also called sais and is the city from which amasis the king was sprung and the citizens have a deity who is their foundress she is called in the egyptian tongue nath which is asserted by them to be the same whom the hellenes call athene now the citizens of this city are great lovers of the athenians and say that they are in some way related to them thither came solon who was received by them with great honour and he asked the priests who were most skilful in such matters about antiquity and made the discovery that neither he nor any other hellene knew anything worth mentioning about the times of old 
on one occasion when he was drawing them on to speak of antiquity he began to tell about the most ancient things in our part of the world about foroneus who is called the first and about niobe and after the deluge to tell of the lives of deucalion and pyrrha and he traced the genealogy of their descendants and attempted to reckon how many years old were the events of which he was speaking and to give the dates thereupon one of the priests who was of very great age said o solon solon you hellenes are but children and there is never an old man who is an hellene solon hearing this said what do you mean i mean to say he replied that in mind you are all young there is no old opinion handed down among you by ancient tradition nor any science which is hoary with age and i will tell you the reason of this there have been and there will be again many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes there is a story which even you have preserved that once upon a time phaethon the son of helios having yoked the seeds of his father's chariot because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father burnt up all that was upon the earth and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt now this has the form of a myth but really signifies a declination of the bodies moving around the earth and in the heavens and a great conflagration of things upon the earth recurring at long intervals of time when this happens those who live upon the mountains and in dry and lofty places are more liable to destruction than those who dwell by rivers or on the sea shore and from this calamity the nile who is our never failing saviour saves and delivers us when on the other hand the gods purge the earth with a deluge of water among you herdsmen and shepherds on the mountains are the survivors whereas those of you who live in cities are carried by the rivers into the sea but in this country neither at that time nor at any other does the water come from above on the fields having always a tendency to come up from below for which reason the things preserved here are said to be the oldest the fact is that wherever the extremity of winter frost or of summer sun does not prevent the human race is always increasing at times and at other times diminishing in numbers and whatever happened either in your country or in ours or in any other region of which we are informed if any action which is noble or great or in any other way remarkable has taken place all that has been written down of old and is preserved in our temples whereas you and other nations are just being provided with letters and the other things which states require and then at the usual period the stream from heaven descends like a pestilence and leaves only those of you who are destitute of letters and education and thus you have to begin all over again as children and know nothing of what happened in ancient times either among us or among yourselves as for those genealogies of yours which you have recounted to us solon they are no better than the tales of children for in the first place you remember one deluge only 
whereas there were many of them and in the next place you do not know that there dwelt in your land the fairest and noblest race of men which ever lived of whom you and your whole city are but a seed or remnant and this was unknown to you because for many generations the survivors of that destruction died and made no sign for there was a time so long before that great deluge of all when the city which now is athens was first in war and was pre-eminent for the excellence of her laws and is said to have performed the noblest deeds and to have had the fairest constitution of any of which tradition tells under the face of heaven solon marvelled at this and earnestly requested the priest to inform him exactly and in order about these former citizens you are welcome to hear about them solon said the priest but for your own sake and for that of the city and above all for the sake of the goddess who is the common patron and protector and educator of both our cities she founded your city a thousand years before ours receiving from the earth and hephaestus the seeds of your race and then she founded ours the constitution of which is set down in our sacred registers as eight thousand years ago as touching the citizens of nine thousand years ago i will briefly inform you of their laws and of the noblest of their actions and the exact particulars of the whole we will hereafter go through at our leisure in the sacred registers themselves if you compare these very laws with your own you will find that many of ours are the counterpart of yours as they were in the olden time in the first place there is the caste of priests which is separated from all others next there are the artificers who exercise their several crafts by themselves and without admixture of any other and also there is the class of shepherds and that of hunters as well as that of husbandmen and you will observe too that the warriors in egypt are separated from all the other classes and are commanded by the law only to engage in war moreover the weapons with which they are equipped are shields and spears and this the goddess taught first among you and then in asiatic countries and we among the asiatics first adopted then as to wisdom do you observe what care the law took from the very first searching out and comprehending the whole order of things down to prophecy and medicine the latter with a view to health and out of these divine elements drawing what was needful for human life and adding every sort of knowledge which was connected with them all this order and arrangement the goddess first imparted to you when establishing your city and she chose the spot of earth in which you were born because she saw that the happy temperament of the seasons in that land would produce the wisest of men wherefore the goddess who was a lover both of war and of wisdom selected and first of all settled that spot which was the most likely to produce men like herself and there you dwelt having such laws as these and still better ones and excelled all mankind in all virtue as became the children and disciples of the gods many great and wonderful deeds are recorded of your state in our histories but one of them exceeds all the rest 
in greatness and valour for these histories tell of a mighty power which was aggressing wantonly against the whole of europe and asia and to which your city put an end this power came forth out of the atlantic ocean for in those days the atlantic was navigable and there was an island situated in front of the straits which you call the columns of heracles the island was larger than libya and asia put together and was the way to other islands and from the islands you might pass through the whole of the opposite continent which surrounded the true ocean for this sea which is within the straits of heracles is only a harbour having a narrow entrance but that other is a real sea and the surrounding land must be truly called a continent now in the island of atlantis there was a great and wonderful empire which had rule over the whole island and several others as well as over parts of the continent and besides these they subjected the parts of libya within the columns of heracles as far as egypt and of europe as far as tyrrhenia the vast power thus gathered into one endeavoured to subdue at one blow our country and yours and the whole of the land which was within the straits and then solon your country shone forth in the excellence of her virtue and strength among all mankind for she was the first in courage and military skill and was the leader of the hellenes and when the rest fell off from her being compelled to stand alone after having undergone the very extremity of danger she defeated and triumphed over the invaders and preserved from slavery those who were not yet subjected and freely liberated all the others who dwelt within the limits of heracles but afterward there occurred violent earthquakes and floods and in a single day and night of rain all your warlike men in a body sunk into the earth and the island of atlantis in like manner disappeared and was sunk beneath the sea and that is the reason why the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable because there is such a quantity of shallow mud in the way and this was caused by the subsidence of the island plato's dialogues two six seventeen timaeus but in addition to the gods whom you have mentioned i would specially invoke mnemosyne for all the important part of what i have to tell is dependent on her favour and if i can recollect and recite enough of what was said by the priests and brought hither by solon i doubt not that i shall satisfy the requirements of this theatre to that task then i will at once address myself let me begin by observing first of all that nine thousand was the sum of years which had elapsed since the war which was said to have taken place between all those who dwelt outside the pillars of heracles and those who dwelt within them this war i am now to describe of the combatants on the one side the city of athens was reported to have been the ruler and to have directed the contest the combatants on the other side were led by the kings of the islands of atlantis which as i was saying once had an extent greater than that of libya and asia and when afterwards sunk by an earthquake became an impassable barrier of mud to voyagers sailing from hence to the ocean the progress of the history will unfold the various tribes of barbarians and hellenes which then existed as they successively appear on the scene 
but i must begin by describing first of all the athenians as they were in that day and their enemies who fought with them and i shall have to tell of the power and form of government of both of them let us give the precedence to athens many great deluges have taken place during the nine thousand years for that is the number of years which have elapsed since the time of which i am speaking and in all the ages and changes of things there has never been any settlement of the earth flowing down from the mountains as in other places which is worth speaking of it has always been carried round in a circle and disappeared in the depths below the consequence is that in comparison of what then was there are remaining in small islets only the bones of the wasted body as they may be called all the richer and softer parts of the soil having fallen away and the mere skeleton of the country being left and next if i have not forgotten what i heard when i was a child i will impart to you the character and origin of their adversaries for friends should not keep their stories to themselves but have them in common yet before proceeding farther in the narrative i ought to warn you that you must not be surprised if you should hear hellenic names given to the foreigners i will tell you the reason of this solon who was intending to use the tale for his poem made an investigation into the meaning of the names and found that the early egyptians in writing them down had translated them into their own language and he recovered the meaning of the several names and retranslated them and copied them out again in our language my great-grandfather dropidas had the original writing which is still in my possession and was carefully studied by me when i was a child therefore if you hear names such as are used in this country you must not be surprised for i have told you the reason of them end of section two section three of atlantis the antediluvian world by ignatius loyola donnelly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicholas james bridgewater atlantis the antediluvian world by ignatius loyola donnelly the tale which was of great length began as follows i have before remarked in speaking of the allotments of the gods that they distributed the whole earth into portions differing in extent and made themselves temples and sacrifices and poseidon receiving for his lot the island of atlantis begat children by a mortal woman and settled them in a part of the island which i will proceed to describe on the side toward the sea and in the centre of the whole island there was a plain which is said to have been the fairest of all plains and very fertile near the plain again and also in the centre of the island at a distance of about fifty stadia there was a mountain not very high on any side in this mountain there dwelt one of the earth-born primeval men of that country whose name was evanor and he had a wife named leucippe and they had an old daughter who was named clito the maiden was growing up to womanhood when her father and mother died poseidon fell in love with her and had intercourse with her and breaking the ground enclosed the hill in which she dwelt all around making alternate zones of sea and land larger and smaller 
encircling one another. There were two of land and three of water, which he turned as with a lathe out of the center of the island, equidistant every way, so that no man could get to the island, for ships and voyages were not yet heard of. He himself, as he was a god, found no difficulty in making special arrangements for the center island, bringing two streams of water under the earth, which he caused to ascend as springs, one of warm water and the other of cold, and making every variety of food to spring up abundantly in the earth. He also begat and brought up five pairs of male children, dividing the island of Atlantis into ten portions. He gave to the firstborn of the eldest pair his mother's dwelling and the surrounding allotment, which was the largest and best, and made him king over the rest. The others he made princes, and gave them rule over many men and a large territory. And he named them all, the eldest who was king, he named Atlas, and from him the whole island and the ocean received the name of Atlantic. To his twin brother, who was born after him, and obtained as his lot the extremity of the island towards the pillars of Heracles, as far as the country which is still called the region of Gades in that part of the world, he gave the name which in the Hellenic language is Eumelus. In the language of the country which is named after him, Gadirus. Of the second pair of twins, he called one Ampheres, and the other Evemon. To the third pair of twins he gave the names Mnesius to the elder, and Otochthon to the one who followed him. Of the fourth pair of twins he called the elder Elasippus, and the younger Mestor. And of the fifth pair he gave to the elder the name of Azais, and to the younger Diaprepes. All these and their descendants were the inhabitants and rulers of diverse islands in the open sea, and also, as has been already said, they held sway in the other direction over the country within the pillars as far as Egypt and Tyrrhenia. Now Atlas had a numerous and honorable family, and his eldest branch always retained the kingdom, which the eldest son handed on to his eldest for many generations, and they had such an amount of wealth as was never before possessed by kings and potentates, and is not likely ever to be again, and they were furnished with everything which they could have, both in city and country. For, because of the greatness of their empire, many things were brought to them from foreign countries and the island itself provided much of what was required by them for the uses of life in the first place they dug out of the earth whatever was to be found there mineral as well as metal and that which is now only a name and was then something more than a name or a calcium was dug out of the earth in many parts of the island, and, with the exception of gold, was esteemed the most precious of metals among the men of those days. There was an abundance of wood for carpenter's work, and sufficient maintenance for tame and wild animals. Moreover, there were a great number of elephants in the island, and there was provision for animals of every kind, both for those which live in lakes and marshes and rivers, and also for those which live in mountains and on plains, and therefore for the animal which is the largest and most voracious of them. Also, whatever fragrant things there are in the earth, whether roots or herbage 
or woods or distilling drops of flowers or fruits grew and thrived in that land and again the cultivated fruit of the earth both the dry edible fruit and other species of fruit which we call by the general name of legumes and the fruits having a hard rind affording drinks and meats and ointments and good store of chestnuts and the like which may be used to play with and are fruits which spoil with keeping and the pleasant kinds of dessert which console us after dinner when we are full and tired of eating all these that sacred island lying beneath the sun brought forth fair and wondrous in infinite abundance all these things they received from the earth and they employed themselves in constructing their temples and palaces and harbors and docks and they arranged the whole country in the following manner first of all they bridged over the zones of sea which surrounded the ancient metropolis and made a passage into and out of they began to build the palace in the royal palace and then the habitation of the god and of their ancestors this they continued to ornament in successive generations every king surpassing the one who came before him to the utmost of his power until they made the building a marvel to behold for size and for beauty and beginning from the sea they dug a canal three hundred feet in width and one hundred feet in depth and fifty stadia in length which they carried through to the outermost zone making a passage from the sea up to this which became a harbour and leaving an opening sufficient to enable the largest vessels to find ingress moreover they divided the zones of land which parted the zones of sea constructing bridges of such a width as would leave a passage for an entire trireme to pass out of into another and roofed them over and there was a way underneath for the ships for the banks of the zones were raised considerably above the water now the largest of the zones into which a passage was cut from the sea was three stadia in breadth and the zone of land which came next of equal breadth and the next two as well as the zone of water as of land were two stadia and the one which surrounded the central island was a stadium only in width the island in which the passage was situated had a diameter of five stadia this and the zones and the bridge which was the sixth part of a stadium in width they surrounded by a stone wall on either side placing towers and gates on the bridges where the sea passed in the stone which was then used in the work they quarried from underneath the centre island and from underneath the zones on the outer as well as the inner side one kind of stone was white another black and a third red and as they quarried they at the same time hollowed out docks double within having roofs formed out of the native rock some of their buildings were simple but in others they put together different stones which they intermingled for the sake of ornament to be a natural source of delight the entire circuit of the wall which went round the outermost one they covered with a coating of brass and the circuit of the next wall they coated with tin and the third which encompassed the citadel flashed with the red light of orichalcum the palaces in the interior of the citadel were constructed in this wise in the centre was a holy temple dedicated to clito and poseidon which remained inaccessible and was surrounded by an enclosure of gold this was the spot 
in which they originally begat the race of the ten princes and thither they annually brought the fruits of the earth in their season from all the ten portions and performed sacrifices to each of them here too was poseidon's own temple of a stadium in length and half a stadium in width and of a proportionate height having a sort of barbaric splendor all the outside of the temple with the exception of the pinnacles they covered with silver and the pinnacles with gold in the interior of the temple the roof was of ivory adorned everywhere with gold and silver and auricalcum all the other parts of the walls and pillars and floor they lined with auricalcum in the temple they placed statues of gold there was the god himself standing in a chariot the charioteer of six winged horses and of such a size that he touched the roof of the building with his head around him there were a hundred nereids riding on dolphins for such was thought to be the number of them in that day there were also in the interior of the temple other images which had been dedicated by private individuals and around the temple on the outside were placed statues of gold of all the ten kings and of their wives and there were many other great offerings both of kings and of private individuals coming both from the city itself and the foreign cities over which they held sway there was an altar too which in size and workmanship corresponded to the rest of the work and there were palaces in like manner which answered to the greatness of the kingdom and the glory of the temple in the next place they used fountains both of cold and hot springs these were very abundant and both kinds wonderfully adapted to use by reason of the sweetness and excellence of their waters they constructed buildings about them and planted suitable trees also cisterns some open to the heaven other which they roofed over to be used in winter as warm baths there were the king's baths and the baths of private persons which were kept apart also separate baths for women and others again for horses and cattle and to them they gave as much adornment as was suitable for them the water which ran off they carried some to the grove of poseidon where were growing all manner of trees of wonderful height and beauty owing to the excellence of the soil the remainder was conveyed by aqueducts which passed over the bridges to the outer circles and there were many temples built and dedicated to many gods also gardens and places of exercise some for men and some set apart for horses in both of the two islands formed by the zones and in the centre of the larger of the two there was a race course of a stadium in width and in length allowed to extend all round the island for horses to race in also there were guard horses at intervals for the bodyguard the more trusted of whom had their duties appointed to them in the lesser zone which was nearer the acropolis while the most trusted of all had houses given them within the citadel and about the persons of the kings the docks were full of triremes and naval stores and all things were quite ready for use enough of the plan of the royal palace crossing the outer harbours which were three in number you would come to a wall which began at the sea and went all around this was everywhere distant fifty stadia from the largest zone and harbour and enclosed the whole meeting at the mouth of the channel toward the sea the entire area was densely crowded with habitations and the canal and the largest of the harbours were full of vessels and merchants coming from all parts who 
from their numbers kept up a multitudinous sound of human voices and din of all sorts night and day i have repeated his descriptions of the city and the parts about the ancient palace nearly as he gave them and now i must endeavour to describe the nature and arrangement of the rest of the country the whole country was described as being very lofty and precipitous on the side of the sea but the country immediately about and surrounding the city was a level plain itself surrounded by mountains which descended toward the sea it was smooth and even but of an oblong shape extending in one direction three thousand stadia and going up the country from the sea through the centre of the island two thousand stadia the whole region of the island lies toward the south and is sheltered from the north the surrounding mountains he celebrated for their number and size and beauty in which they exceeded all that are now to be seen anywhere having in them also many wealthy inhabited villages and rivers and lakes and meadows supplying food enough for every animal wild or tame and wood of various sorts abundant for every kind of work i will now describe the plain which had been cultivated during many ages by many generations of kings it was rectangular and for the most part straight and oblong and what it wanted of the straight line followed the line of the circular ditch the depth and width and length of this ditch were incredible and gave the impression that such a work in addition to so many other works could hardly have been wrought by the hand of man but i must say what i have heard it was excavated to the depth of a hundred feet and its breadth was a stadium everywhere it was carried round the whole of the plain and was ten thousand stadia in length it received the streams which came down from the mountains and winding round the plain and touching the city at various points was there led off into the sea from above likewise straight canals of a hundred feet in width were cut in the plain and again let off into the ditch toward the sea these canals were at intervals of a hundred stadia and by them they brought down the wood from the mountains to the city and conveyed the fruits of the earth in ships cutting transverse passages from one canal into another and to the city twice in the year they gathered the fruits of the earth in winter having the benefit of the rains and in summer introducing the water of the canals as to the population each of the lots in the plain had an appointed chief of men who were fit for military service and the rise of the lot was to be a square of ten stadia each way and the total number of all the lots was sixty thousand and of the inhabitants of the mountains and of the rest of the country there was also a vast multitude having leaders to whom they were assigned according to their dwellings and villages the leader was required to furnish for the war the sixth portion of a war chariot so as to make up a total of ten thousand chariots also two horses and riders upon them and a light chariot without a seat accompanied by a fighting man on foot carrying a small shield and having charioteer mounted to guide the horses also he was bound to furnish two heavy armed men two archers two slingers three stone shooters and three javelin men who were skirmishers and four sailors to make up a complement of twelve hundred ships such was the order of war in the royal city that of the other nine governments was different in each of them and would be wearisome to narrate as to offices and honours 
the following was the arrangement from the first each of the ten kings in his own division and in his own city had an absolute control of the citizens and in many cases of the laws punishing and slaying whomsoever he would now the relations of their governments to one another were regulated by the injunctions of poseidon as the law had handed them down these were inscribed by the first men on a column of orichalcum which was situated in the middle of the island at the temple of poseidon whither the people were gathered together every fifth and sixth years alternately thus giving equal honor to the odd and to the even number and when they were gathered together they consulted about public affairs and inquired if any one had transgressed in anything and passed judgment on him accordingly and before they passed judgment they gave their pledges to one another in this wise there were bulls who had the range of the temple of poseidon and the ten who were left alone in the temple after they had offered prayers to the gods that they might take the sacrifices which were acceptable to them hunted the bulls without weapons but with staves and nooses and the bull which they caught they led up to the column the victim was then struck on the head by them and slain over the sacred inscription now on the column besides the law there was inscribed an oath invoking mighty curses on the disobedient when therefore after offering sacrifice according to their customs they had burnt the limbs of the bull they mingled a cup and cast in a clot of blood for each of them the rest of the victim they took to the fire after having made a purification of the column all round then they drew from the cup in golden vessels and pouring a libation on the fire they swore that they would judge according to the laws on the column and would punish any one who had previously transgressed and that for the future they would not if they could help transgress any of the inscriptions and would not command or obey any ruler who commanded them to act otherwise than according to the laws of their father poseidon this was the prayer which each of them offered up for himself and for his family at the same time drinking and dedicating the vessel in the temple of the god and after spending some necessary time at supper when darkness came on and the fire about the sacrifice was cool all of them put on most beautiful azure robes and sitting on the ground at night near the embers of the sacrifices on which they had sworn and extinguishing all the fire about the temple they received and gave judgment if any of them had any accusation to bring against any one and when they had given judgment at daybreak they wrote down their sentences on a golden tablet and deposited them as memorials with their robes there were many special laws which the several kings had inscribed about the temples but the most important was the following that they were not to take up arms against one another and they were all to come to the rescue if any one in any city attempted to overthrow the royal house like their ancestors they were to deliberate in common about war and other matters giving the supremacy to the family of atlas and the king was not to have the power of life and death over any of his kinsmen unless he had the assent of the majority of the ten kings such was the vast power which the god settled in the lost island of atlantis and this he afterward directed against our land on the following pretext as traditions tell for many generations as long as the divine nature lasted in them 
they were obedient to the laws and well affectioned toward the gods who were their kinsmen for they possessed true and in every way great spirits practicing gentleness and wisdom in the various chances of life and in their intercourse with one another they despised everything but virtue not caring for their present state of life and thinking lightly on the possession of gold and other property which seemed only a burden to them neither were they intoxicated by luxury nor did wealth deprive them of their self-control but they were sober and saw clearly that all these goods are increased by virtuous friendship with one another and that by excessive zeal for them and honor of them the good of them is lost and friendship perishes with them by such reflections and by the continuance in them of a divine nature all that which we have described waxed and increased in them but when this divine portion began to fade away in them and became diluted too often and with too much of the mortal admixture and the human nature got the upper hand then they being unable to bear their fortune became unseemly and to him who had an eye to see they began to appear base and had lost the fairest of their precious gifts but to those who had no eye to see the true happiness they still appeared glorious and blessed at the very time when they were filled with unrighteous avarice and power zeus the god of gods who rules with law and is able to see into such things perceiving that an honourable race was in a most wretched state and wanting to inflict punishment on them that they might be chastened and improved collected all the gods into his most holy habitation which being placed in the centre of the world sees all things that partake of generation and when he had called them together he spake as follows here plato's story abruptly ends end of section three end of part one chapter two Section 4, Part 1, Chapter 3 of Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. Chapter 3. The Probabilities of Plato's Story. There is nothing improbable in this narrative, so far as it describes a great, rich, cultured, and educated people. Almost every part of Plato's story can be paralleled by descriptions of the people of Egypt or Peru. In fact, in some respects, Plato's account of Atlantis falls short of Herodotus's description of the grandeur of Egypt, or Prescott's picture of the wealth and civilization of Peru. For instance, Prescott, in his Conquest of Peru, volume 1, page 95, says, The most renowned of the Peruvian temples, the pride of the capital and the wonder of the empire, was at Cusco, where, under the munificence of successive sovereigns, it had become so enriched that it received the name Coricancha, or the place of gold. The interior of the temple was literally a mine of gold. On the western wall was emblazoned a representation of the deity, consisting of a human countenance, looking forth from amid innumerable rays of light, which emanated from it in every direction, in the same manner as the sun is often personified with us. The figure was engraved on a massive plate of gold, of enormous dimensions, thickly powdered with emeralds and precious stones. The walls and ceilings were everywhere encrusted with golden ornaments. Every part of the interior of the temple glowed with burnished plates and studs of precious metal. 
the cornices were of the same material there are in plato's narrative no marvels no myths no tales of gods gorgons hobgoblins or giants it is a plain and reasonable history of a people who built temples ships and canals who lived by agriculture and commerce who in pursuit of trade reached out to all the countries around them the early history of most nations begins with gods and demons while here we have nothing of the kind we see an immigrant enter the country marry one of the native women and settle down in time a great nation grows up around him it reminds one of the information given by the egyptian priest to herodotus during the space of eleven thousand three hundred and forty years they assert says herodotus that no divinity has appeared in human shape they absolutely deny the possibility of human beings descent from a god if plato had sought to draw from his imagination a wonderful and pleasing story we should not have had so plain and reasonable a narrative he would have given us a history like the legends of greek mythology full of the adventures of gods and goddesses nymphs fauns and satyrs neither is there any evidence on the face of this history that plato sought to convey in it a moral or political lesson in the guise of a fable as did bacon in the new atlantis and more in the kingdom of nowhere there is no ideal republic delineated here it is a straightforward reasonable history of a people ruled over by kings living and progressing as other nations have lived and progressed since their day plato says that in atlantis there was a great and wonderful empire which aggressed wantonly across the whole of europe and asia thus testifying to the extent of its dominion it not only subjugated africa as far as egypt and europe as far as italy but it ruled as well over parts of the continent to wit the opposite continent of america which surrounded the true ocean those parts of america over which it ruled were as we will show hereafter central america peru and the valley of the mississippi occupied by the mound builders moreover he tells us that this vast power was gathered into one that is to say from egypt to peru it was one consolidated empire we will see hereafter that the legends of the hindus as to the deva nahusha distinctly refer to this vast empire which covered the whole of the known world another corroboration of the truth of plato's narrative is found in the fact that upon the azores black lava rocks and rocks red and white in color are now found he says they built with white red and black stone sir c y Ville thompson describes a narrow neck of land between fayal and mount daguia called mount quimada the burnt mountain as follows it is formed partly of stratified tuffa of a dark chocolate color and partly of lumps of black lava porous and each with a large cavity in the center which must have been ejected as volcanic bombs in a glorious display of fireworks at some period beyond the records of acorian history but late in the geological annals of the island voyage of the challenger volume two page twenty four he also describes immense walls of black volcanic rock in the island the plain of atlantis plato tells us had been cultivated during many ages by many generations of kings if as we believe agriculture the domestication of the horse ox sheep goat and hog and the discovery or development of wheat oats rye and barley originated in this region then this language of plato in reference to the many ages and the successive generations of kings accords with the great periods of time which were necessary to bring man from a savage to a civilized condition in the great ditch surrounding the whole land like a circle and into which streams flowed down from the mountains we probably see the original of the four rivers of paradise and the emblem of the cross surrounded by a circle which as we will show hereafter was from the earliest pre-christian ages accepted as the emblem of the garden of eden we know that plato did not invent the name of poseidon for the worship of poseidon was universal in the earliest ages of europe 
Poseidon worship seems to have been a peculiarity of all the colonies previous to the time of Sidon. Prehistoric Nations, page 148. This worship was carried to Spain and to northern Africa, but most abundantly to Italy, to many of the islands, and to the regions around the Aegean Sea, also to Thrace. Ibid, page 155. Poseidon, or Neptune, is represented in Greek mythology as a sea god, but he is figured as standing in a war chariot drawn by horses. The association of the horse, a land animal, with the sea god is inexplicable, except with the light given by Plato. Poseidon was a sea god because he ruled over a great land in the sea, and was the national god of a maritime people. He is associated with horses, because in Atlantis, the horse was first domesticated, and, as Plato shows, the Atlanteans had great race courses for the development of speed in horses, and Poseidon is represented as standing in a war chariot, because doubtless wheeled vehicles were first invented by the same people who tamed the horse, and they transmitted these war chariots to their descendants from Egypt to Britain. We know that horses were the favorite object chosen for sacrifice to Poseidon by nations of antiquity within the historic period. They were killed and cast into the sea from high precipices. The religious horse feasts of the pagan Scandinavians were a survival of this Poseidon worship, which once prevailed along all the coasts of Europe. They continued until the conversion of the people to Christianity, and were then suppressed by the church with great difficulty. We find in Plato's narrative the name of some of the Phoenician deities among the kings of Atlantis. Where did the Greek Plato get these names if the story is a fable? Does Plato, in speaking of the fruits having a hard rind, affording drinks and meats and ointments, refer to the coconut? Again, Plato tells us that Atlantis abounded in both cold and hot springs. How did he come to hit upon the hot springs if he was drawing a picture from his imagination? It is a singular confirmation of his story that hot springs abound in the Azores, which are the surviving fragments of Atlantis. And an experience wider than that possessed by Plato has taught scientific men that hot springs are a common feature of regions subject to volcanic convulsions. Plato tells us, the whole country was very lofty and precipitous on the side of the sea, but the country immediately about and surrounding the city was a level plain, itself surrounded by mountains which descended toward the sea. One has but to look at the profile of the Dolphin's Ridge, as revealed by the deep sea soundings of the Challenger, given as the frontispiece to this volume, to see that this is a faithful description of that precipitous elevation. The surrounding mountains, which sheltered the plain from the north, are represented in the present towering peaks of the Azores. Plato tells us that the destruction of Atlantis filled the sea with mud, and interfered with navigation. For thousands of years, the ancients believed the Atlantic Ocean to be a muddy, shallow, dark, and misty sea, Mare Tenebrosum, Cosmos, Volume 2, page 151. The three-pronged scepter, or trident of Poseidon, reappears constantly in ancient history. We find it in the hands of Hindu gods, and at the base of all the religious beliefs of antiquity. Among the numerals, the sacred three has ever been considered the mark of perfection, and therefore exclusively ascribed to the supreme deity, or to its earthly representative, a king, emperor, or any sovereign. For this reason, triple emblems of various shapes are found on the belts, neckties, or any encircling fixture, as can be seen on the works of ancient art in Yucatan, Guatemala, Chiapas, Mexico, etc., whenever the object has reference to divine supremacy. Dr. Arthur Schott, Smith Rep., 1869, page 391. We are reminded of the tiara and the triple round of sovereignty. In the same manner, the ten kingdoms of Atlantis are perpetuated in all the ancient traditions. In the number given by the Bible for the antediluvian patriarchs, we have the first instance of a striking agreement with the traditions of various nations. Ten are mentioned in the book of Genesis. Other nations, to whatever epoch they carry back their ancestors, whether before or after the deluge, 
whether the mythical or historical character prevail. They are constant to this sacred number ten, which some have vainly attempted to connect with the speculations of later religious philosophers on the mystical value of numbers. In Chaldea, Barosus enumerates ten antediluvian kings, whose fabulous reign extended to thousands of years. The legends of the Iranian race commence with the reign of ten Pesadian, Poseidon, kings, men of the ancient law who lived on pure Homa, water of life, nectar, and who preserved their sanctity. In India, we meet with the nine Brahmadikas, who, with Brahma, their founder, make ten, and who are called the ten Petrus, or fathers. The Chinese count ten emperors, partakers of the divine nature, before the dawn of historical times. The Germans believed in the ten ancestors of Odin, and the Arabs in the ten mythical kings of the Adites. Lenormont and Chevalier, Ancient History of the East, Volume 1, page 13. The story of Plato finds confirmation from other sources. An extract preserved in Proclus, taken from a work now lost, which is quoted by Beck in his commentary on Plato, mentions islands in the exterior sea, beyond the pillars of Hercules, and says it was known that in one of these islands, the inhabitants preserved from their ancestors a remembrance of Atlantis, an extremely large island, which for a long time held dominion over all the islands of the Atlantic Ocean. Alien, in his Varia Historia, Book 3, Chapter 18, tells us that Theopomus, 400 B.C., relates the particulars of an interview between Midas, king of Frisia, and Salinas, in which Salinas reported the existence of a large continent beyond the Atlantic, larger than Asia, Europe, and Libya together. He stated that a race of men, called Meropes, dwelt there, and had extensive cities. They were persuaded that their country alone was a continent. Out of curiosity, some of them crossed the ocean, and visited the Hyperboreans. The Gauls possessed traditions upon the subject of Atlantis, which were collected by the Roman historian Timagenes, who lived in the first century before Christ. He represents that three distinct people dwelt in Gaul. 1. The indigenous population, which I suppose to be Mongoloids, who long dwelt in Europe. 2. The invaders from a distant island, which I understand to be Atlantis. 3. The Aryan Gauls. Preadomites, page 380. Marcellus, in a work on the Ethiopians, speaks of seven islands lying in the Atlantic Ocean, probably the Canaries, and the inhabitants of these islands, he says, preserve the memory of a much greater island, Atlantis, which had for a long time exercised dominion over the smaller ones. Ditto Mueller, Fragmenta Historicorium Graeciorum, Volume 4, page 443. Diodorus Siculus relates that the Phoenicians discovered a large island in the Atlantic Ocean, beyond the Pillars of Hercules, several days' sail from the coast of Africa. This island abounded in all manner of riches. The soil was exceedingly fertile. The scenery was diversified by rivers, mountains, and forests. It was the custom of the inhabitants to retire during the summer to magnificent country houses, which stood in the midst of beautiful gardens. Fish and game were found in great abundance. The climate was delicious, and the trees bore fruit all seasons of the year. Homer, Plutarch, and other ancient writers mention islands situated in the Atlantic, several thousand stadia from the pillars of Hercules. Salinas tells Midas that there was another continent besides Europe, Asia, and Africa, a country where gold and silver are so plentiful that they are esteemed no more than we esteem iron. St. Clement, in his epistle to the Corinthians, says that there were other worlds beyond the ocean. Attention may here be called to the extraordinary number of instances in which allusion is made in the Old Testament to the islands of the sea, especially in Isaiah and Ezekiel. What had an inland people, like the Jews, to do with seas and islands? Did these references grow out of vague traditions linking their race with islands in the sea? The Orphic Argonaut sings of the division of the ancient Lictonia into separate islands. He says, 
when the dark-haired Poseidon, in anger with Father Cronion, struck Lictonia with the golden trident. Plato states that the Egyptians told Solon that the destruction of Atlantis occurred 9,000 years before that date, to wit, about 9,600 years before the Christian era. This looks like an extraordinarily long period of time, but it must be remembered that geologists claim that the remains of man found in the caves of Europe date back 500,000 years, and the fossil Calaveras skull was found deep under the base of Table Mountain, California, the whole mountain having been formed since the man to whom it belonged lived and died. M. Opert read an essay at the Brussels Congress to show, from the astronomical observations of the Egyptians and Assyrians, that 11,542 years before our era, man existed on the earth at such a stage of civilization, as to be able to take note of astronomical phenomena, and to calculate with considerable accuracy the length of the year. The Egyptians, he says, calculated by cycles of 1,460 years, zodiacal cycles, as they were called. Their year consisted of 365 days, which caused them to lose one day in every four solar years, and consequently, they would attain their original starting point again only after 1,460 years, 365 times four. Therefore, the zodiacal cycle ending in the year 139 of our era, commenced in the year 1322 B.C. On the other hand, the Assyrian cycle was 1,805 years, or 22,325 lunations. An Assyrian cycle began 712 B.C. The Chaldeans state that between the Deluge and their first historic dynasty, there was a period of 39,180 years. Now what means this number? It stands for 12 Egyptian zodiacal cycles, plus 12 Assyrian lunar cycles, 12 times 1,460 equals 17,520. 12 times 1,805 equals 21,660. Add the sums of the two equations, 17,520 plus 21,660. That equals 39,180. These two modes of calculating time are in agreement with each other, and were known simultaneously to one people, the Chaldeans. Let us now build up the series of both cycles, starting with our era, and the results will be as follows. Zodiacal cycle, 1,460. Lunar cycle, 1,805. Zodiacal cycle, 1,822. Lunar cycle, 712. Zodiacal, 2,782. Lunar, 2,517. Zodiacal, 4,242. Lunar, 4,322. Zodiacal, 5,702. Lunar, 6,127. Zodiacal, 7,162. Lunar, 7,932. Zodiacal, 8,622. Lunar, 9,737. Zodiacal, 110,082. Lunar, 11,542. Zodiacal and lunar, 11,542. At the year 11,542 BC, the two cycles came together, and consequently they had on that year their common origin in one and the same astronomical observation. That observation was probably made in Atlantis. The wide divergence of languages which is found to exist among the Atlanteans at the beginning of the historical period implies a vast lapse of time. The fact that the nations of the old world remembered so little of Atlantis, except the colossal fact of its sudden and overwhelming destruction, would also seem to remove that event into a remote past. Herodotus tells us that he learned from the Egyptians that Hercules was one of their most ancient deities, and that he was one of the twelve produced from the eight gods, seventeen thousand years before the reign of Amasis. In short, I fail to see why this story of Plato, told as history, derived from the Egyptians, a people who, it is known, 
preserve most ancient records, and who were able to trace their existence back to a vast antiquity, should have been contemptuously set aside as a fable by Greeks, Romans, and the modern world. It can be only because our predecessors, with their limited knowledge of the geological history of the world, did not believe it possible that any large part of the earth's surface could have been thus suddenly swallowed up by the sea. Let us then first address ourselves to that question. End of chapter 3 Section 5, Part 1, Chapter 4 of Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. Chapter 4. Was such a catastrophe possible? All that is needed to answer this question is to briefly refer to some of the facts revealed by the study of geology. In the first place, the Earth's surface is a record of successive risings and fallings of the land. The accompanying picture represents a section of the anthracite coal measures of Pennsylvania. Each of the coal deposits here shown, indicated by the black lines, was created when the land had risen sufficiently above the sea to maintain vegetation. Each of the strata of rock, many of them hundreds of feet in thickness, was deposited under water. Here we have 23 different changes of the level of the land during the formation of 2,000 feet of rock and coal. And these changes took place over vast areas, embracing thousands of square miles. All the continents which now exist were, it is well understood, once under water, and the rocks of which they are composed were deposited beneath the water. More than this, most of the rocks so deposited were the detritus or washings of other continents, which then stood where the oceans now roll, and whose mountains and plains were ground down by the action of volcanoes and earthquakes, and frost, ice, wind, and rain, and washed into the sea to form the rocks upon which the nations now dwell so that we have changed the conditions of land and water. That which is now continent was once sea, and that which is now sea was formerly continent. There can be no question that the Australian archipelago is simply the mountain tops of a drowned continent, which once reached from India to South America. Science has gone so far as to give it a name. It is called Lemuria, and here, it is claimed, the human race originated. An examination of the geological formation of our Atlantic states proves beyond a doubt, from the manner in which the sedimentary rocks, the sand, gravel, and mud, aggregating a thickness of 45,000 feet, are deposited that they came from the north and east. They represent the detritus of pre-existing lands, the washings of rain, rivers, coast currents, and other agencies of erosion. And since the areas supplying the waste could scarcely have been less extent than the new strata it formed, it is reasonably inferred that land masses of continental magnitude must have occupied the region now covered by the North Atlantic before America began to be, and onward at least through the Paleozoic ages of American history. The proof of this fact is that the great strata of rocks are thicker the nearer we approach their source in the east. The maximum thickness of the Paleozoic rocks of the Appalachian Formation is 25,000 to 35,000 feet in Pennsylvania and Virginia, while their minimum thickness in Illinois and Missouri is from 3,000 to 4,000 feet. The rougher and grosser textured rocks predominate in the east, while the farther west we go, the finer the deposits were of which the rocks are composed, the finer materials are carried further west by the water. New American Cyclopedia, Article Coal. Destruction of Pompeii. The history of the growth of the European continent, as recounted by Professor Geike, gives an instructive illustration of the relations of geology to geography. The earliest European land, he says, appears to have existed in the north and northwest, comprising Scandinavia, Finland, and the northwest of the British area 
and to have extended thence through boreal and arctic latitudes into north america of the height and mass of this primeval land some idea may be formed by considering the enormous bulk of the material derived from its disintegration in the silurian formations of the british islands alone there is a mass of rock worn from the land which would form a mountain chain extending from marseilles to the north cape one thousand eight hundred miles with a mean breadth of over thirty three thousand miles and an average height of sixteen thousand feet as the great continent which stood where the atlantic ocean now is wore away the continents of america and europe were formed and there seems to have been from remote times a continuous rising still going on of the new lands and a sinking of the old ones within five thousand years or since the age of the polished stone the shores of sweden denmark and norway have risen from two hundred to six hundred feet professor winchell says the Preadamites, page 437. We are in the midst of great changes, and are scarcely conscious of it. We have seen worlds in flames, and have felt a comet strike the earth. We have seen the whole coast of South America lift up bodily ten or fifteen feet, and let down again in an hour. We have seen the Andes sink two hundred and twenty feet in seventy years. Vast transpositions have taken place in the coastline of China. The ancient capital, located, in all probability, in an accessible position near the center of the empire, has now become nearly surrounded by water, and its site is on the peninsula of Korea. There was a time when the rocky barriers of the Thracian Bosphorus gave way and the Black Sea subsided. It had covered a vast area in the north and east. Now this area became drained, and was known as the ancient Lactonia. It is now the prairie region of Russia and the granary of Europe. There is ample geological evidence that at one time the entire area of Great Britain was submerged to the depth of at least 1,700 feet. Over the face of the submerged land was strewn thick beds of sand, gravel, and clay, termed by geologists the Northern Drift. The British islands rose again from the sea, bearing these water deposits on their bosom. What is now Sicily once lay deep beneath the sea. It subsequently rose 3,000 feet above the sea level. The desert of Sahara was once under water, and its now burning sands are a deposit of the sea. Geologically speaking, the submergence of Atlantis, within the historical period, was simply the last of a number of vast changes, by which the continent which once occupied the greater part of the Atlantic had gradually sunk under the ocean, while the new lands were rising on both sides of it. We now come to the second question. Is it possible that Atlantis could have been suddenly destroyed by such a convulsion of nature as described by Plato? The ancients regarded this part of his story as a fable. With the wider knowledge which scientific research has afforded the modern world, we can affirm that such an event is not only possible, but that the history of even the last two centuries has furnished us with striking parallels for it. We now possess the record of numerous islands lifted above the waters, and others sunk beneath the waves, accompanied by storms and earthquakes similar to those which marked the destruction of Atlantis. In 1783, Iceland was visited by convulsions more tremendous than any recorded in the modern annals of that country. About a month previous to the eruption, on the mainland, a submarine volcano burst forth in the sea, at a distance of 30 miles from the shore. It ejected so much pumice that the sea was covered with it for a distance of 150 miles, and ships were considerably impeded in their course. A new island was thrown up, consisting of high cliffs, which was claimed by his Danish majesty, and named Nioe, or the New Island, but before a year had lapsed, it sunk beneath the sea, leaving a reef of rocks thirty fathoms under the water. The earthquake of 1783 in Iceland destroyed 9,000 people out of a population of 50,000. Twenty villages were consumed by fire or inundated by water, and a mass of lava thrown out greater than the entire bulk of Mont Blanc. On the 8th of October, 1822, a great earthquake occurred on the island of Java, near the mountain of Galang Gung. 
A loud explosion was heard, the earth shook, and immense columns of hot water and boiling mud, mixed with burning brimstone, ashes, and lapilli, of the size of nuts, were projected from the mountain like a water spout, with such prodigious violence, that large quantities fell beyond the river Tandoy, which is forty miles distant. The first eruption lasted nearly five hours, and on the following days, the rain fell ill torrents, the rivers, densely charged with mud, deluged the country far and wide. At the end of four days, October 12th, a second eruption occurred, more violent than the first, in which hot water and mud were again vomited, and great blocks of basalt were thrown to the distance of seven miles from the volcano. There was at the same time a violent earthquake. The face of the mountain was utterly changed, its summits broken down, and one side, which had been covered with trees, became an enormous gulf in the form of a semicircle. Over 4,000 persons were killed, and 114 villages destroyed. Lyle's Principles of Geology, page 430. In 1831, a new island was born in the Mediterranean, near the coast of Sicily. It was called Graham's Island. It came up with an earthquake, and a water spout 60 feet high and 800 yards in circumference rising from the sea. In about a month, the island was 200 feet high and 3 miles in circumference. It soon, however, sank beneath the sea. The Canary Islands were probably a part of the original empire of Atlantis. On the 1st of September, 1730, the earth split open near year, in the island of Lanzarote. In one night, a considerable hill of ejected matter was thrown up. In a few days, another vent opened and gave out a lava stream which overran several villages. It flowed at first rapidly, like water, but became afterward heavy and slow, like honey. On the 11th of September, more lava flowed out, covering up a village, and precipitating itself with a horrible roar into the sea. Dead fish floated on the waters in indescribable multitudes, or were thrown dying on the shore. The cattle throughout the country dropped lifeless to the ground, suffocated by putrid vapors, which condensed and fell down in drops. These manifestations were accompanied by a storm such as the people of the country had never known before. These dreadful commotions lasted for five years. The lavas thrown out covered one-third of the whole island of Lanzarote. Calabrian Peasants Engulfed by Crevasses, 1783 The Gulf of Santorin, in the Gratian Archipelago, has been for 2,000 years a scene of actic volcanic operations. Pliny informs us that in the year 186 BC, the island of Old Kemeni, or the Sacred Isle, was lifted up from the sea, and in A.D. 19, the island of Thea, the Divine, made its appearance. In A.D. 1573, another island was created, called the Small Sunburnt Island. In 1848, a volcanic convulsion of three months' duration created a great shoal. An earthquake destroyed many houses in Thera, and the sulfur and hydrogen issuing from the sea killed 50 persons and 1,000 domestic animals. A recent examination of these islands shows that the whole mass of Santorin has sunk, since its projection from the sea, over 1,200 feet. The fort and village of Sindri, on the eastern arm of the Indus, above Lukput, was submerged in 1819 by an earthquake, together with a tract of country 2,000 square miles in extent. In 1828, Sir A. Burns went in a boat to the ruins of Sindri, where a single remaining tower was seen in the midst of a wide expanse of sea. The tops of the ruined walls still rose two or three feet above the level of the water, and standing on one of these, he could behold nothing in the horizon but water, except in one direction, where a blue streak of land to the north indicated the Ula Bund. This scene, says Lyle, Principles of Geology, page 462, presents to the imagination a lively picture of the revolutions now in progress on the earth, a waste of water where a few years before all was land, and the only land visible consisting of ground uplifted by a recent earthquake. We give from Lyell's great work 
the following curious pictures of the appearance of the fort of Sindri before and after the inundation. Fort of Sindri, on the eastern branch of the Indus, before it was submerged by the earthquake of 1819. In April 1815, one of the most frightful eruptions recorded in history occurred in the province of Tomboro, in the island of Sambawa, about 200 miles from the eastern extremity of Java. It lasted from April 5th to July of that year, but was most violent on the 11th and 12th of July. The sounds of the explosions were heard for nearly 1,000 miles. Out of a population of 12,000, in the province of Tambora, only 26 individuals escaped. Violent whirlwinds carried up men, horses, and cattle into the air, tore up the largest trees by the roots, and covered the whole sea with floating timber. Raffles, History of Java, Volume 1, page 28. The ashes darkened the air. The floating cinders to the westward of Sumatra formed, on the 12th of April, a mass two feet thick and several miles in extent, through which ships with difficulty forced their way. The darkness in daytime was more profound than the blackest night. The town called Tomboro, on the west side of Sambawa, was overflowed by the sea, which encroached upon the shore, so that the water remained permanently eighteen feet deep in places where there was land before. The area covered by the convulsion was one thousand English miles in circumference. In the island of Amboyna, in the same month and year, the ground opened, threw out water, and then closed again. Raffles' History of Java, Volume 1, page 25. View of the Fort of Sindri, from the West, in March, 1839. But it is at that point of the European coast nearest to the site of Atlantis, at Lisbon, that the most tremendous earthquake of modern times has occurred. On the 1st of November, 1775, a sound of thunder was heard underground, and immediately afterward, a violent shock threw down the greater part of the city. In six minutes, 60,000 persons perished. A great concourse of people had collected for safety upon a new quay, built entirely of marble, but suddenly it sunk down with all the people on it, and not one of the dead bodies ever floated to the surface. A great number of small boats and vessels anchored near it, and, full of people, were swallowed up as in a whirlpool. No fragments of these wrecks ever rose again to the surface. The water where the quay went down is now 600 feet deep. The area covered by this earthquake was very great. Humboldt says that a portion of the earth's surface, four times as great as the size of Europe, was simultaneously shaken. It extended from the Baltic to the West Indies, from Canada to Algiers. At eight leagues from Morocco, the ground opened and swallowed a village of 10,000 inhabitants, and closed again over them. It is very probable that the center of the convulsion was in the bed of the Atlantic, at or near the buried island of Atlantis, and that it was a successor of the great earth throw which, thousands of years before, had wrought destruction upon that land. Eruption of Vesuvius in 1737 Ireland also lies near the axis of this great volcanic area, reaching from the Canaries to Iceland, and has been many times in the past the seat of disturbance. The ancient annals contain several accounts of eruptions, preceded by volcanic action. In 1490, at the Ox Mountains, Sligo, one occurred by which one hundred persons and numbers of cattle were destroyed, and a volcanic eruption in May, 1788, on the hill of Knocklade, Antrim, poured out a stream of lava sixty yards wide for thirty-nine hours, and destroyed the village of Baliowin and all the inhabitants, save a man and his wife and two children. American Cyclopedia, Article, Ireland while we find Lisbon in Ireland, east of Atlantis, subjected to these great earthquake shocks, the West India Islands, west of the same center, had been repeatedly visited in a similar manner. In 1692, Jamaica suffered from a violent earthquake. The earth opened, and great quantities of water were cast out. Many people were swallowed up in these rents. The earth caught some of them by the middle and squeezed them to death. The heads of others only appeared above ground. 
a tract of land near the town of Port Royal, about a thousand acres in extent, sunk down in less than a minute, and the sea immediately rolled in. The Azor Islands are undoubtedly the peaks of the mountains of Atlantis. They are even yet the center of great volcanic activity. They have suffered severely from eruptions and earthquakes. In 1808, a volcano rose suddenly in San Jorge to the height of 3,500 feet, and burnt for six days, desolating the entire island. In 1811, a volcano rose from the sea, near San Miguel, creating an island 300 feet high, which was named Sambrina, but which soon sunk beneath the sea. Similar volcanic eruptions occurred in the Azores in 1691 and 1720. Along a great line, a mighty fracture in the surface of the globe, stretching north and south through the Atlantic, we find a continuous series of active or extinct volcanoes. In Iceland we have Oriafa, Hecla, and Radua Kamba, another in Pico, in the Azores, the peak of Tenerife, Fogo, in one of the Cape de Verde Islands, while of extinct volcanoes we have several in Iceland, and two in Madeira, while Fernando de Noroja, the island of Ascension, St. Helena, and Tristan da Cunha, are all of volcanic origins. Cosmos, Volume 5, page 331. The following singular passage we quote entire from Lyell's Principles of Geology, page 436. In the Nautical Magazine for 1835, page 642, and for 1838, page 361, and in the Comptes Rendus, April 1838, accounts are given of a series of volcanic phenomena, earthquakes, troubled waters, floating scoria, and columns of smoke, which have been observed at intervals since the middle of the last century, in the space of open sea between longitudes 20 degrees and 22 minutes west, about half a degree south of the equator. These facts, says Mr. Darwin, seem to show that an island or archipelago is in progress of formation in the middle of the Atlantic. A line joining St. Helena and Ascension would, if prolonged, intersect this slowly nascent focus of volcanic action. Should land be eventually formed here, it will not be the first that has been produced by Ignatius action in this ocean since it was inhabited by the existing species of Testacea. At Porto Praia, in Santiago, one of the Azores, a horizontal calcareous stratum occurs, containing shells of recent marine species, covered by a great sheet of basalt 80 feet thick. It would be difficult to estimate too highly the commercial and political importance which a group of islands might acquire if, in the next two or three thousand years, they should rise in mid-ocean between St. Helena and Ascension. These facts would seem to show that the great fires which destroyed Atlantis are still smoldering in the depths of the ocean. The vast oscillations which carried Plato's continent beneath the sea may again bring it, with all its buried treasures, to the light. And that even the wild imagination of Jules Verne, when he described Captain Nemo, in his diving armor, looking down upon the temples and towers of the lost island, lit by the fires of submarine volcanoes, had some groundwork of possibility to build upon. But who will say, in the presence of all the facts here enumerated, that the submergence of Atlantis, in some great world-shaking cataclysm, is either impossible or improbable? As will be shown hereafter, we come to discuss the flood legends. Every particular which has come down to us of the destruction of Atlantis has been duplicated in some of the accounts just given. We conclude, therefore, 1. That it is proven beyond question, by geological evidence, that vast masses of land once existed in the region where Atlantis is located by Plato, and that therefore such an island must have existed. 2. That there is nothing improbable or impossible in the statement that it was destroyed suddenly by an earthquake, in one dreadful night and day. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. Chapter 5. The Testimony of the Sea. Suppose we were to find in mid-Atlantic, in front of the Mediterranean, in the neighborhood of the Azores, the remains of an immense island sunk beneath the sea, one thousand miles in width, and two or three thousand miles long. Would it not go far to confirm the statement of Plato that, beyond the strait where you place the pillars of Hercules, there was an island larger than Asia Minor, and Libya combined, called Atlantis? And suppose we found that the Azores were the mountain peaks of this drowned island, and were torn and rent by tremendous volcanic convulsions, while around them, descending into the sea, were found great strata of lava, and the whole face of the sunken land was covered for thousands of miles with volcanic debris. Would we not be obliged to confess that these facts furnish strong, corroborative proofs of the truth of Plato's statement? that in one day and one fatal night there came many earthquakes and inundations which engulfed the mighty people atlantis disappeared beneath the sea and then that sea became inaccessible on account of the quantity of mud which the engulfed island left in its place and all these things recent investigations has proved conclusively deep sea soundings have been made by ships of different nations the United States ship Dolphin, the German frigate Gazelle, and the British ships Hydra, Porcupine, and Challenger have mapped out the bottom of the Atlantic, and the result is the revelation of a great elevation reaching from one point on the coast of the British Isles southward to the coast of South America at Cape Orange, thence southeastwardly to the coast of Africa, and thence southwardly to Tristan Diahuna. I give one map showing the profile of this elevation in its frontispiece, and another map showing the outlines of the submerged land, on page 47. It rises about 9,000 feet above the great Atlantic depths around it, and in the Azores, St. Paul's Rock, Ascension, and Tristan Diahuna, it reaches the surface of the ocean. Evidence that this elevation was once dry land is found in the fact that the inequalities, the mountains, and valleys of its surface could never have been produced in accordance with any laws for the deposition or sediment, nor by submarine elevation, but, on the contrary, must have been carved by agents acting above the water level. Scientific America, July 28, 1877. Mr. J. Stark Gardner, the eminent English geologist, is of the opinion that in the Eocene period a great extension of land existed to the west of Cornwall, referring to the location of the Dolphin and Challenger ridges, he asserts that a great tract of land formerly existed where the sea now is, and that Cornwall, the Sicily and Channel Islands, Ireland and Brittany are the remains of its highest summits. Popular Science Review, July 1878 here, then, we have the backbone of the ancient continent, which once occupied the whole of the Atlantic Ocean, and from whose washings Europe and America were constructed. The deepest parts of the ocean, 3,500 fathoms deep, represent those portions which sunk first, to wit, the plains to the east and west of the central mountain ranges. Some of the loftiest peaks of this range, the Azores, St. Paul's, Ascension, Tristan de Acumba, are still above the ocean level, and while the great body of Atlantis lies a few hundred fathoms beneath the sea, in these connected rings we see the pathways which were once extended between the New World and the Old, and by means of which the plants and animals of one continent traveled to the other, and by the same avenues black men found their way, as we will show hereafter, from Africa to America, and red men from America to Africa. And, as I have shown, the same great law which gradually depressed the Atlantic continent and raised the lands east and west of it is still at work. 
the coast of greenland which may be regarded as the northern extremity of the atlantic continent is still sinking so rapidly that the ancient buildings on low rock islands are now submerged and the greenlander has learned by experience never to build near the water's edge north amir of antique page 504 the same subsidence is going on along the shore of south carolina and georgia while the north of europe and the atlantic coast of south america are rising rapidly along the latter raised beaches one thousand one hundred eighty miles long and from one hundred to thirteen hundred feet high have been traced when these connecting ridges extended from america to europe and africa they shut off the flow of the tropical waters of the ocean to the north there was then no gulf stream the land-locked ocean that paved the shores of northern europe was then intensely cold and the result was the glacial period when the barriers of atlantis sunk deficiently to permit the natural expansion of the heated water of the tropics to the north the ice and snow which covered europe gradually disappeared the gulf stream flowed around atlantis and it still retains the circular motion first imparted to it by the presence of the island the officers of the challenger found the entire ridge of atlantis covered with volcanic deposits these are subsided with mud which as plato tells us rendered the sea impassable after the destruction of the island it does not follow that at the time atlantis was finally engulfed the ridges connecting it with america and africa rose above the water level these may have gradually subsided into, into the sea or have gone down in catacillisms such as are described in the central american books the atlantis of plato may have been confined to the dolphin ridge of our map the united states sloop gettysburg has also made some remarkable discoveries in the neighboring field. I quote from John James Wilde in Nature, March 1, 1877, page 377. The recent announced discovery by Commander Gorringe of the United States Sloop Gettysburg of a bank of soundings bearing north 85 degrees west and distant 130 miles from Cape St. Vincent during the last voyage of the vessel across the atlantic taken in connection with previous soundings obtained in the same region of the north atlantic suggests the probable existence of a submarine ridge or plateau connecting the island of madeira with the coasts of portugal and the probable subaerial connection in prehistoric times of that island with the southwestern extremity of europe these soundings reveal the existence of a channel of an average depth of from two thousand to three thousand fathoms extending in a northeasterly direction from its entrance between madeira and the canary islands towards cape st vincent commander gorringe when about a hundred and fifty miles from the strait of gibraltar found that the sounding decreased from two thousand fathoms to sixteen hundred fathoms in the distance of a few miles the subsequent soundings, five miles apart, gave 900, 500, 400, and 100 fathoms, and eventually a depth of 32 fathoms was obtained, in which the vessel anchored. The bottom was found to be consistent of live pink coral, and the position of the bank, in latitude 36 degrees 29 minutes north, longitude 11 degrees 33 minutes west. The map on page 51 shows the position of these elevations. They must have been originally islands, stepping stones, as it were, between Atlantis and the coast of Europe. Sir C. Wyville Thompson found that the specimens of the fauna of the coast of Brazil brought up in his dredging machine are similar to those of the western coast of southern Europe. This is accounted for by the connecting ridges reaching from Europe to South America. A member of the Challenger staff, in a lecture delivered in London, soon after the termination of the expedition, gave it as his opinion that the great submarine plateau is the remains of the lost Atlantis. End of chapter 5。Section 7, Part 1, Chapter 6 of Atlantis, the Antidiluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. Chapter 6. The Testimony of the Flora and Fauna. Proofs are abundant that there must have been at one time uninterrupted land communication between Europe and America. In the words of a writer upon this subject, when the animals and plants of the old and new world are compared, one cannot but be struck with their identity. All or nearly all belong to the same genera, while many, even of the species, are common to both continents. This is most important in its bearing on our theory, as indicating that they radiated from a common center after the glacial period. The hairy mammoth, woolly-haired rhinoceros, the Irish elk, the muskox, the reindeer, the glutton, the lemming, etc., more or less accompanied this flora, and their remains are always found in the post-glacial deposits of Europe as low down as the south of France. In the New World, beds of the same age contain similar remains, indicating that they came from a common center and were spread out over both continents alike. Recent discoveries in the fossil beds of the Badlands of Nebraska proved that the horse originated in America. Professor Marsh of Yale College has identified the several preceding forms from which it was developed, rising in the course of ages from a creature not larger than a fox, until, by successive steps, it developed into the true horse. How did the wild horse pass from America to Europe and Asia if there was not continuous land communication between the two continents? He seems to have existed in Europe in a wild state prior to his domestication by man. The fossil remains of the camel are found in India, Africa, South America, and in Kansas. The existing alpacas and llamas of South America are but varieties of the camel family. The cave bear, whose remains are found associated with the hones of the mammoth and the bones and works of man in the caves of Europe, was identical with the grizzly bear of our Rocky Mountains. The muskox, whose relics are found in the same deposits, now roams the wilds of Arctic America. The glutton of northern Europe in the Stone Age is identical with the wolverine of the United States. According to Ruttemeyer, the ancient bison, Vos Priscus, of Europe was identical with the existing American buffalo. Every stage between the ancient cave bison and the European oryx can be traced. The Norway elk, now nearly extinct, is identical with the American moose. The Cervus americanus, found in Kentucky, was as large as the Irish elk, which it greatly resembled. The lagomise, or tailless hair, of the European eaves is now found in the colder regions of North America. The reindeer, which once occupied Europe as far down as France, was the same as the reindeer of America. Remains of the cave lion of Europe, Felix Spilloe, a larger beast than the largest of the existing species, have been found at Natchez, Mississippi. The European cave wolf was identical with the American wolf. Cattle were domesticated among the people of Switzerland during the earliest part of the Stone Period that is to say, before the Bronze Age and the Age of Iron. Even at that remote period they had already, by long-continued selection, been developed out of wild forms akin to the American buffalo. M. Gervais concludes that the wild race from which our domestic sheep was derived is now extinct. The remains of domestic sheep are found in the debris of the Swiss lake dwellings during the Stone Age. The domestic horse, ass, lion, and goat also date back to a like great antiquity. We have historical records 7,000 years old, and during that time no similar domestication of a wild animal has been made. This fact speaks volumes as to the vast period of time during which man must have lived in a civilized state to effect the domestication of so many and such useful animals. And when we turn from the fauna to the flora, we find the same state of things. An examination of the fossil beds of Switzerland of the Miocene age reveals the remains of more than 800 different species of flower-bearing plants, besides mosses, ferns, etc. The total number of fossil plants catalogued from those beds, cryptogamous as well as phanogamous, is upward of 3,000. The majority of these species have migrated to America. There were others that passed into Asia, Africa, and even to Australia. The American types are, however, in the largest proportion. The analogues of the flora of the Miocene age of Europe now grow in the forests of Virginia, North and South Carolina, and Florida. They include such familiar examples as magnolias, tulip trees, evergreen oaks, maples, plane trees, robinas, sequoias, etc. It would seem to be impossible that these trees could have migrated from Switzerland to America 
unless there was unbroken land communication between the two continents. It is a still more remarkable fact that a comparison of the flora of the old world and new goes to show that not only was there communication by land, over which the plants of one continent could extend to another, but that man must have existed and have helped this transmigration, in the case of certain plants that were incapable of making the journey unaided. Otto Kuntz, a distinguished German botanist, who has spent many years in the tropics, announced his conclusion that, in America and in Asia, the principal domesticated tropical plants are represented by the same species. He insists the Manaho utilissima, whose roots yield a fine flower, the taro, colocasia esculenta, the Spanish or red pepper, the tomato, the bamboo, the guava, the mango fruit, and especially the banana. He denies that the American origin of tobacco, maize, and the coconut is proved. He refers to the peritium tiliosum, a malvaceous plant hardly noticed by Europeans, but very highly prized by the natives of the tropics, and cultivated everywhere in the East and West Indies. It supplies to the natives of these regions so far apart their ropes and cordage. It is always seedless in a cultivated state. It existed in America before the arrival of Columbus. But Professor Kuntz pays a special attention to the banana or plantain. The banana is seedless. It is found throughout tropical Asia and Africa. Professor Kuntz asks, In what way was this plant, which cannot stand a voyage through the temperate zone, carried to America? And yet it was generally cultivated in America before 1492. Says Professor Kuntz, It must be remembered that the plantain is a tree-like herbaceous plant, possessing no easily transportable bulbs, like the potato or the dahlia, nor propagable by cuttings like the willow or the poplar. It has only a perennial root, which once planted needs hardly any care, and yet produces the most abundant crop of any known tropical plant. He then proceeds to discuss how it could have passed from Asia to America. He admits that the roots must have been transported from one country to the other by civilized man. He argues that it could not have crossed the Pacific from Asia to America, because the Pacific is nearly thrice or four times as wide as the Atlantic. The only way he can account for the plantain reaching America is to suppose that it was carried there, when the North Pole had a tropical climate. Is there any proof that civilized man existed at the North Pole when it possessed the climate of Africa? Is it not more reasonable to suppose that the plantain, or banana, was cultivated by the people of Atlantis, and carried by their civilized agricultural colonies to the east and the west? Do we not find a confirmation of this view in the fact alluded to by Professor Kuntz in these words? A cultivated plant which does not possess seeds must have been under culture for a very long period. We have not in Europe a single exclusively seedless, berry-bearing cultivated plant, and hence it is perhaps fair to infer that these plants were cultivated as early as the beginning of the middle of the Diluvian period. Is it possible that a plant of this kind could have been cultivated for this immense period of time in both Asia and America? Where are the two nations, agricultural and highly civilized, on those continents by whom it was so cultivated? What has become of them? Where are the traces of their civilization? All the civilizations of Europe, Asia, and Africa radiated from the Mediterranean. The Hindu Aryans advanced from the northwest. They were kindred to the Persians, who were next-door neighbors to the Arabians, cousins of the Phoenicians, and who lived alongside of the Egyptians who had in turn derived their civilization from the Phoenicians. It would be a marvel of marvels if one nation on one continent had cultivated the banana for such a vast period of time until it became seedless. The nation retaining a peaceful, continuous agricultural civilization during all that time, but to suppose that two nations could have cultivated the same plant under the same circumstances on two different continents for the same unparalleled lapse of time is supposing an impossibility. We find just such a civilization as was necessary, according to Plato, and under just such a climate, in Atlantis and nowhere else. We have found it reaching, by its contiguous islands, with one hundred and fifty miles of the coast of Europe on the one side, and almost touching the West India Islands on the other, while by its connecting ridges it bound together Brazil and Africa. But it may be said these animals and plants may have passed from Asia to America across the Pacific by the continent of Lemuria or there may have been continuous land communication at one time at Bering Strait. True, but an examination of the flora of the Pacific states shows that very many of the trees and plants common to Europe and the Atlantic states are not to be seen west of the Rocky Mountains. The magnificent magnolias, the tulip trees, the plane trees, etc., which were found existing in the Miocene age in Switzerland, 
and are found at the present day in the United States are altogether lacking on the Pacific coast. The sources of supply of that region seem to have been far inferior to the sources of supply of the Atlantic states. Professor Asa Gray tells us that, out of the sixty-six genera and one hundred and fifty-five species found in the forests east of the Rocky Mountains, only thirty-one genera and seventy-eight species are found west of the mountains. The Pacific coast possesses no pawpaw, no linden or basswood, no locust trees, no cherry tree large enough for a timber tree, no gum trees, no sorrel tree, nor calmia, no persimmon trees, not a holly, only one ash that may be called a timber tree, no catalpa or sassafras, not a single elm or hackberry, not a mulberry, not a hook, not a hickory, or a beech, or a true chestnut. These facts would seem to indicate that the forest flora of North America entered it from the east, and that the Pacific states possess only those fragments of it that were able to struggle over or around the great dividing mountain chain. We thus see that the flora and fauna of America and Europe testify not only to the existence of Atlantis, but to the fact that in an earlier age it must have extended from the shores of one continent to those of the other, and by this bridge of land the plants and animals of one region pass to the other. The cultivation of the cotton plant and the manufacture of its product was known to both the old and new world. Herodotus describes it as the tree of India that bears a fleece more beautiful than that of the sheep. Columbus found the natives of the West Indies using cotton cloth. It was also found in Mexico and Peru. It is a significant fact that the cotton plant has been found growing wild in many parts of America, but never in the Old World. This would seem to indicate that the plant was a native of America, and this is confirmed by the superiority of American cotton and the further fact that the plants taken from America to India constantly degenerate, while those taken from India to America as constantly improve. There is a question whether the potato, maize, and tobacco were not cultivated in China ages before Columbus discovered America. A recent traveler says, The interior of China along the course of the Yangtze Kiang is a land full of wonders. In one place, piscicultural nurseries line the banks for nearly fifty miles, all sorts of inventions, the cotton gin included, claimed by Europeans and Americans, are to be found there forty centuries old. Plants yielding drugs of great value, without number, the familiar tobacco and potato, maize, white and yellow corn, and other plants believed to be indigenous to America, have been cultivated there from time immemorial. Boniface attributes a European or Asiatic origin to maize. The word maize is derived from mahis or mahis the name of the plant in the language of the island of Haiti. And yet strange to many, in the Lettish and Livonian languages in the north of Europe, maize signifies bread, in Irish maize is food, and in Old High German maize is meat. May not likewise the Spanish maize have antedated the time of Columbus, and borne testimony to early intercommunication between people of the old and new worlds? Is it to Atlantis we must look for the origin of nearly all our valuable plants? Darwin says, it has often been remarked that we do not owe a single useful plant to Australia or the Cape of Good Hope, countries abounding to an unparalleled degree with endemic species, or to New Zealand or to America south of the Plata, and according to some authors, not to America north of Mexico. In other words, the domesticated plants are only found within the limits of what I shall show hereafter was the empire of Atlantis and its colonies. For only here was to be found an ancient, long-continuing civilization capable of developing from a wild state those plants which were valuable to man, including all the cereals on which today civilized man depends for subsistence. Monsieur Alphonse de Condole tells us that we owe thirty-three useful plants to Mexico, Peru, and Chile. According to the same high authority, of a hundred and fifty-seven valuable cultivated plants, eighty-five can be traced back to their wild state. As to forty, there is doubt as to their origin, while thirty-two are utterly unknown in their aboriginal condition. Certain roses, the imperial lily, the tuberose, and the lilac, are said to have been cultivated from such a vast antiquity that they are not known in their wild state. And these facts are the more remarkable because, as de Condole has shown, all the plants historically known to have been first cultivated in Europe still exist there in the wild state. The inference is strong that the great cereals, wheat, oats, barley's rye, and maize, must have been first domesticated in a vast antiquity, or in some continent which has since disappeared, carrying the original wild plants with it. Cereals of the Age of Stone in Europe Darwin quotes approvingly the opinion of Mr. Bentham. 
as the result of all the most reliable evidence that none of the cerealia wheat rye barley and oats exist or have existed truly wild in their present state in the stone age of europe five varieties of wheat and three of barley were cultivated he says that it may be inferred from the presence in the lake habitations of switzerland of a variety of wheat known as the egyptian wheat and from the nature of the weeds that grew among their crops that the lake inhabitants either still kept up commercial intercourse with some southern people or had originally proceeded as colonists from the south i should argue that they were colonists from the land where wheat and barley were first domesticated to wit atlantis when the bronze age came we find oats and rye making their appearance with the weapons of bronze together with a peculiar kind of pea darwin concludes that wheat barley rye and oats were either descended from ten or fifteen distinct species most of which are now unknown or extinct or from four or eight species closely resembling our present forms or so widely different as to escape identification in which latter case he says man must have cultivated the cereals at an enormously remote period and at that time practised some degree of selection rawlinson expresses the opinion that the ancient assyrians possessed the pineapple the representation on the monuments is so exact that i can scarcely doubt the pineapple being intended the pineapple bromelia ananassa is supposed to be of american origin and unknown to europe before the time of columbus and yet apart from the revelations of the assyria monuments there has been some dispute upon this point ancient irish pipes it is not even certain that the use of tobacco was not known to the colonists from atlantis settled in ireland in an age long ago to sir walter raleigh great numbers of pipes have been found in the raths and the tumuli of ireland which there is every reason to believe were placed there by men of the prehistoric period the illustration on page sixty three represents some of the so-called danes pipes now in the collection of the royal irish academy the danes entered ireland many centuries before the time of columbus and if the pipes are theirs they must have used tobacco or some substitute for it at this early period it is probable however that the tumuli of ireland antedates the danes thousands of years ancient indian pipe new jersey compare these pipes from the ancient mounds of ireland with the accompanying picture of an indian pipe of the stone age of new jersey recent portuguese travellers have found the most remote tribes of savage negroes in africa holding no commercial intercourse with europeans using strangely shaped pipes in which they smoked a plant of the country investigations in america lead to the conclusion that tobacco was first burnt as an incense to the gods the priests alone using the pipe and from this beginning the extraordinary practice spread to the people and thence over all the world it may have crossed the atlantic in a remote age and have subsequently disappeared with the failure of retrograding colonists to raise the tobacco plant end of part one chapter six section eight of atlantis the antediluvian world by ignatius loyola donnelly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nicholas james bridgewater atlantis the antediluvian world by ignatius loyola donnelly section eight part two the deluge chapter one the destruction of atlantis described in the deluge legends having demonstrated as we think successfully that there is no improbability in the statement of plato that a large island almost a continent existed in the past in the atlantic ocean nay more that it is a geological certainty that it did exist and having further shown that it is not improbable but very possibly that it may have sunk beneath the sea in the manner described by plato we come now to the next question is the memory of this gigantic catastrophe preserved among the traditions of mankind we think there can be no doubt that an affirmative answer must be given to this question an event which in a few hours destroyed amid horrible convulsions an entire country with all its vast population that population the ancestors of the great races of both continents and they themselves 
the custodians of the civilization of their age could not fail to impress with terrible force the minds of men and to project its gloomy shadow over all human history and hence whether we turn to the hebrews the aryans the phoenicians the greeks the cushites or the inhabitants of america we find everywhere traditions of the deluge and we shall see that all these traditions point unmistakably to the destruction of atlantis francois lenormant says contemporary review november eighteen seventy nine the result authorizes us to affirm the story of the deluge to a universal tradition among all branches of the human race with the one exception however of the black now a recollection thus precise and concordant cannot be a myth voluntarily invented no religious or cosmogonic myth presents this character of universality it must arise from the reminiscence of a real and terrible event so powerfully impressing the imagination of the first ancestors of our race as never to have been forgotten by their descendants this cataclysm must have occurred near the first cradle of mankind and before the dispersion of the families from which the principal races were to spring for it would be at once improbable and uncritical to admit that at as many different points of the globe as we should have to assume in order to explain the widespread of these traditions local phenomena so exactly alike should have occurred their memory having assumed an identical form and presenting circumstances that need not necessarily have occurred to the mind in such cases let us observe however that probably the diluvian tradition is not primitive but imported in america that it undoubtedly wears the aspect of an importation among the rare populations of the yellow race where it is found and lastly that it is doubtful among the polynesians of oceania there will still remain three great races to which it is undoubtedly peculiar who have not borrowed it from each other but among whom the tradition is primitive and goes back to the most ancient times and these three races are precisely the only ones of which the bible speaks as being descended from noah those of which it gives the ethnic filiation in the tenth chapter of genesis this observation which i hold to be undeniable attaches a singularly historic and exact value to the tradition as recorded by the sacred book even if on the other hand it may lead to giving it a more limited geographical and ethnological significance but as the case now stands we do not hesitate to declare that far from being a myth the biblical deluge is a real and historical fact having to say the least left its impress on the ancestors of three races aryan or indo-european semitic or syro-arabian hamitic or cushite that is to say on the three great civilized races of the ancient world those which constitute the higher humanity before the ancestors of those races had as yet separated and in the part of asia they together inhabited such profound scholars and sincere christians as m schwobel paris eighteen fifty eight and m omelius d'aloy brussels eighteen sixty six deny the universality of the deluge and claim that quote, 
it extended only to the principal centre of humanity to those who remained near its primitive cradle without reaching the scattered tribes who had already spread themselves far away in almost desert regions it is certain that the bible narrative commences by relating facts common to the whole human species confining itself subsequently to the annals of the race peculiarly chosen by the designs of providence End quote. lenormand and chevalier ancient history of the east page forty four this theory is supported by that eminent authority on anthropology m de quatrefage as well as by cuvier the rev r p bellink s j admits that it has nothing expressly opposed to orthodoxy plato identifies quote, the great deluge of all end quote, with the destruction of atlantis the priest of sais told solon that before quote, the great deluge of all end quote, athens possessed a noble race who performed many noble deeds the last and greatest of which was resisting the attempts of atlantis to subjugate them and after this came the destruction of atlantis and the great convulsion which overwhelmed that island destroyed a number of the greeks so that the egyptians who possessed the memory of many partial deluges regarded this as quote, the great deluge of all end, quote. end of part two chapter one end of section eight section nine part two chapter two of atlantis the antediluvian world by ignatius loyola donnelly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicholas james bridgewater atlantis the antediluvian world by ignatius loyola donnelly section nine chapter two the deluge of the bible we give first the bible history of the deluge as found in genesis chapter six to chapter eight and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of god saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose and the lord said my spirit shall not always strive with man for he also is flesh yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of god came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown and god saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and it repented the lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart and the lord said i will destroy man whom i have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repenteth me that i have made them but noah found grace in the eyes of the lord these are the generations of noah noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and noah walked with god and noah begat three sons shem ham and japheth the earth also was corrupt before god and the earth was filled with violence and god looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth and god said unto noah 
the end of all flesh is come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them and behold i will destroy them with the earth make thee an ark of gopher wood rooms thou shalt make in the ark and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of the length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits the breadth of it fifty cubits and the height of it thirty cubits a window shalt thou make to the ark and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower second and third stories shalt thou make it and behold i even i do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die but with thee will i establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons wives with thee and of every living thing of all flesh two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee they shall be male and female of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten and thou shalt gather it to thee and it shall be for food for thee and for them thus did noah according to all that god commanded him so did he and the lord said unto noah come thou and all thy house into the ark for thee have i seen righteous before me in this generation of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens the male and his female and of beasts that are not clean by two the male and his female of fowls also of the air by sevens the male and the female to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth for yet seven days and i will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights and every living substance that i have made will i destroy from off the face of the earth and noah did according unto all that the lord commanded him and noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth and noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth there went in two and two unto noah into the ark the male and the female as god had commanded noah and it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth in the six hundredth year of noah's life in the second month the seventeenth day of the month the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights in the selfsame day entered noah and shem and ham and japheth the sons of noah and noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with him into the ark they and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind every bird of every sort and they went in unto noah into the ark two and two of all flesh wherein is the breath of life and they that went in went in male and female of all flesh 
as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare upon the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. And the waters prevailed, and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died and every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven and they were destroyed from the earth and noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark and the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days and god remembered noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark and god made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters returned from off the earth continually and after the end of the hundred and fifty days and the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of ararat and the waters decreased continually until the tenth month in the tenth month on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen and it came to pass at the end of forty days that noah opened the window of the ark which he had made and he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth and also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground but the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot and she returned unto him into the ark for the waters were on the face of the whole earth then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark and he stayed yet other seven days and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark and the dove came into him in the evening and lo in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off so noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth and he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove which returned not again unto him any more and it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year in the first month the first day of the month the waters were dried up from off the earth and noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold the face of the ground was dry and in the second month on the seven and twentieth day of the month was the earth dried and god spake unto noah saying go forth of the ark thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons wives with thee bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth and noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons wives with him every beast every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark and noah builded an altar unto the lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl 
and offered burnt offerings on the altar and the lord smelled a sweet savour and the lord said in his heart i will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth neither will i again smite any more every thing living as i have done while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease let us briefly consider this record it shows taken in connection with the opening chapters of genesis one that the land destroyed by water was the country in which the civilization of the human race originated adam was at first naked genesis chapter three seven then he clothed himself in leaves then in the skins of animals chapter three twenty one he was the first that tilled the earth having emerged from a more primitive condition in which he lived upon the fruits of the forest chapter two sixteen his son abel was the first of those that kept flocks of sheep chapter four two his son cain was the builder of the first city chapter four seventeen his descendant tubal cain was the first metallurgist chapter four twenty two jabal was the first that erected tents and kept cattle chapter four twenty jubal was the first that made musical instruments we have here the successive steps by which a savage race advances to civilization we will see hereafter that the atlanteans passed through precisely similar stages of development two the bible agrees with plato in the statement that these antediluvians had reached great populousness and wickedness and that it was on account of their wickedness god resolved to destroy them three in both cases the inhabitants of the doomed land were destroyed in a great catastrophe by the agency of water they were drowned four the bible tells us that in an earlier age before their destruction mankind had dwelt in a happy peaceful sinless condition in a garden of eden plato tells us the same thing of the earlier ages of the atlanteans five in both the bible history and plato's story the destruction of the people was largely caused by the intermarriage of the superior or divine race the sons of god with an inferior stock the children of men whereby they were degraded and rendered wicked we will see hereafter that the hebrews and their flood legend are closely connected with the phoenicians whose connection with atlantis is established in many ways it is now conceded by scholars that the genealogical table given in the bible genesis chapter ten is not intended to include the true negro races or the chinese the japanese the finns or laps the australians or the american red men it refers altogether to the mediterranean races the aryans the cushites the phoenicians the hebrews and the egyptians the sons of ham were not true negroes but the dark brown races see winchell's pre-adamites chapter seven if these races the chinese australians americans etc are not descended from noah they could not have been included in the deluge if neither china japan america northern europe nor australia were depopulated by the deluge the deluge could not have been universal but as it is alleged that it did destroy a country and drowned all the people thereof except noah and his family the country so destroyed could not have been europe asia africa america or australia for there has been no universal destruction of the people of those regions or if there had been how can we account for the existence today of people of all those countries whose descent genesis does not trace back to noah and in fact 
about whom the writer of genesis seems to have known nothing we are thus driven to one of two alternative conclusions either the deluge record of the bible is altogether fabulous or it relates to some land other than europe asia africa or australia some land that was destroyed by water it is not fabulous and the land it refers to is not europe asia africa or australia but atlantis no other land is known to history or tradition that was overthrown in a great catastrophe by the agency of water that was civilized populous powerful and given over to wickedness that high and orthodox authority francois lenormand says quote, ancient history of the east volume one page sixty four the descendants of shem ham and japhet so admirably catalogued by moses include one only of the races of humanity the white race whose three chief divisions he gives us as now recognized by anthropologists the other three races yellow black and red have no place in the bible list of nations sprung from noah End quote. as therefore the deluge of the bible destroyed only the land and people of noah it could not have been universal the religious world does not pretend to fix the location of the garden of eden the rev george leo haydock says quote, the precise situation cannot be ascertained how great might be its extent we do not know and we will see hereafter that the unwritten traditions of the church pointed to a region in the west beyond the ocean which bounds europe in that direction as the locality in which quote, mankind dwelt before the deluge End quote. it will be more and more evident as we proceed in the consideration of the flood legends of other nations that the antediluvian world was none other than atlantis end of part two chapter two end of section nine section ten part two chapter three of atlantis the antediluvian world by ignatius loyola donnelly this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicholas james bridgewater atlantis the antediluvian world by ignatius loyola donnelly section ten chapter three the deluge of the chaldeans we have two versions of the chaldean story unequally developed indeed but exhibiting a remarkable agreement the one most anciently known and also the shorter is that which Beresus took from the sacred books of babylon and introduced into the history that he wrote for the use of the greeks after speaking of the last nine antediluvian kings the chaldean priest continues thus obartes el baratutu being dead his son xisuthros chasisatra reigned eighteen saris sixty four thousand eight hundred years it was under him that the great deluge took place the history of which is told in the sacred documents as follows chronos ea appeared to him in his sleep and announced that on the fifteenth of the month of dicios the assyrian month sivan a little before the summer solstice all men should perish by a flood he therefore commanded him to take the beginning the middle and the end of whatever was consigned to writing and to bury it in the city of the sun at sippara 
and to build a vessel and to enter it with his family and dearest friends to place in this vessel provisions to eat and drink and to cause animals birds and quadrupeds to enter it lastly to prepare everything for navigation and when xisuthros inquired in what direction he should steer his bark he was answered toward the gods and enjoined to pray that good might come of it for men xisuthros obeyed and constructed a vessel five stadia long and five broad he collected all that had been prescribed to him and embarked his wife his children and his intimate friends the deluge having come and soon going down xisuthros loosed some of the birds these finding no food nor place to alight on returned to the ship a few days later xisuthros again let them free but they returned again to the vessel their feet full of mud finally loosed the third time the birds came no more back then xisuthros understood that the earth was bare he made an opening in the roof of the ship and saw that it had grounded on the top of a mountain he then descended with his wife his children and his pilot who worshipped the earth raised an altar and there sacrificed to the gods at the same moment he vanished with those who accompanied him meanwhile those who had remained in the vessel not seeing sisothros return descended too and began to seek him calling him by name they saw xisuthros no more but a voice from heaven was heard commanding them piety toward the gods that he indeed was receiving the reward of his piety in being carried away to dwell thenceforth in the midst of the gods and that his wife his daughter and the pilot of the ship shared the same honor the voice further said that they were to return to babylon and conformably to the decrees of fate disinter the writings buried at sipara in order to transmit them to men it added that the country in which they found themselves was armenia these then having heard the voice sacrificed to the gods and returned on foot to babylon of the vessel of xisuthros which had finally landed in armenia a portion is still to be found in the gordian mountains in armenia and pilgrims bring thence asphalt that they have scraped from its fragments it is used to keep off the influence of witchcraft as to the companions of xisuthros they came to babylon disinterred the writings left at sipara founded numerous cities built temples and restored babylon by the side of this version says lenormand which interesting though it be is after all second-hand we are now able to place an original chaldeo babylonian edition which the lamented george smith was the first to decipher on the cuneiform tablets exhumed at nineveh and now in the british museum here the narrative of the deluge appears as an episode in the eleventh tablet or eleventh chant of the great epic of the town of uruk the hero of this poem a kind of hercules whose name has not as yet been made out with certainty being attacked by disease a kind of leprosy goes with a view to its cure to consult the patriarch saved from the deluge Chasisatra, in the distant land to which the gods have transported him there to enjoy eternal felicity he asks Chasisatra to reveal the secret of the events which led to his obtaining the privilege of immortality and thus the patriarch is induced to relate the cataclysm by a comparison of the three copies of the poem that the library of the palace of nineveh contained it has been possible to restore the narrative with hardly any breaks these three copies were 
by order of the king of assyria ashurbanabal made in the eighth century b c from a very ancient specimen in the sacerdotal library of the town of uruk founded by the monarchs of the first chaldean empire it is difficult precisely to fix the date of the original copied by assyrian scribes but it goes back to the ancient empire seventeen centuries at least before our era and even probably beyond it was therefore much anterior to moses and nearly contemporaneous with abraham the variations presented by the three existing copies prove that the original was in the primitive mode of writing called the hieratic a character which must have already become difficult to decipher in the eighth century b c as the copyists had differed as to the interpretation to be given to certain signs and in other cases have simply reproduced exactly the forms of such as they did not understand finally it results from a comparison of these variations that the original transcribed by order of ashurbanabal must itself have been a copy of some still more ancient manuscript it which the original text had already received interlinear comments some of the copyists have introduced these into their text others have omitted them with these preliminary observations i proceed to give integrally the narrative ascribed in the poem to Khasisatra. i will reveal to thee o istubar the history of my preservation and tell to thee the decision of the gods the town of shuripak a town which thou knowest is situated on the euphrates it was ancient and in it men did not honour the gods i alone i was their servant to the great gods the gods took counsel on the appeal of an a deluge was proposed by bel and approved by nabon nergal and adar and the god ea the immutable lord repeated this command in a dream i listened to the decree of fate that he announced and he said to me man of shuripak son of ubaratutu thou build a vessel and finish it quickly by a deluge i will destroy substance and life cause thou to go up into the vessel the substance of all that has life the vessel thou shalt build six hundred cubits shall be the measure of its length and sixty cubits the amount of its breadth and of its height launch it thus on the ocean and cover it with a roof i understood and i said to ea my lord the vessel that thou commandest me to build thus when i shall do it young and old shall laugh at me ea opened his mouth and spoke he said to me his servant if they laugh at thee thou shalt say to them shall be punished he who has insulted me for the protection of the gods is over me like to caverns i will exercise my judgment on that which is on high and that which is below close the vessel at a given moment that i shall cause thee to know enter into it and draw the door of the ship toward thee within it thy grains thy furniture thy provisions thy riches thy men servants and thy maid servants and thy young people the cattle of the field and the wild beasts of the plain that i will assemble and that i will send thee shall be kept behind thy door khasisatra opened his mouth and spoke he said to ea his lord no one has made such a ship on the prow i will fix i shall see and the vessel the vessel thou commandest me to build thus which in on the fifth day the two sides of the bark were raised 
in its covering fourteen in all were its rafters fourteen in all did it count above i placed its roof and i covered it i embarked in it on the sixth day i divided its floors on the seventh i divided the interior compartments on the eighth i stopped up the chinks through which the water entered in i visited the chinks and added what was wanting i poured on the exterior three times three thousand six hundred measures of asphalt and three times three thousand six hundred measures of asphalt within three times three thousand six hundred men porters brought on their beads the chests of provisions i kept three thousand six hundred chests for the nourishment of my family and the mariners divided among themselves twice three thousand six hundred chests for provisioning i had oxen slain i instituted rations for each day in anticipation of the need of drinks of barrels and of wine i collected in quantity like to the waters of a river of provisions in quantity like the dust of the earth to arrange them in the chests i set my hand to of the sun the vessel was completed strong and i carried above and below the furniture of the ship the lading filled the two-thirds all that i possessed i gathered together all i possessed of silver i gathered together all i possessed of gold i gathered all that i possessed of the substance of life of every kind i gathered together i made all ascend into the vessel my servants male and female the cattle of the fields the wild beasts of the plains and the sons of the people i made them all ascend shamash the sun made the moment determined and he announced it in these terms in the evening i will cause it to rain abundantly from heaven enter into the vessel and close the door the fixed moment had arrived when he announced in these terms in the evening i will cause it to rain abundantly from heaven when the evening of that day arrived i was afraid i entered into the vessel and shut my door in shutting the vessel to buzur shadi rabi the pilot i confided this dwelling with all that it contained musheri ina namari rose from the foundations of heaven in a black cloud Ramman thundered in the midst of the cloud and nabon and sharru marched before they marched devastating the mountain and the plain nergal the powerful dragged chastisements after him adar advanced overthrowing before him the archangels of the abyss brought destruction in their terrors they agitated the earth the inundation of ramman swelled up the sky and the earth became without lustre was changed into a desert they broke of the surface of the earth like they destroyed the living beings of the surface of the earth the terrible deluge on men swelled up to heaven the brother no longer saw his brother men no longer knew each other in heaven the gods became afraid of the water spout and sought a refuge they mounted up to the heaven of anu the gods were stretched out motionless pressing one against another like dogs ishtar wailed like a child the great goddess pronounced her discourse here is humanity returned into mud and this is the misfortune that i have announced in the presence of the gods so i announced the misfortune in the presence of the gods for the evil i announced the terrible chastisement of men who are mine i am the mother who gave birth to men and like to the race of fishes there they are filling the sea and the gods by reason of that which the archangels of the abyss are doing weep with me the gods on their seats were seated in tears and they held their lips closed revolving future things six days and as many nights passed the wind 
the water-spout and the diluvian rain were in all their strength at the approach of the seventh day the diluvian rain grew weaker the terrible water-spout which had assailed after the fashion of an earthquake grew calm the sea inclined to dry up and the wind and the water spout came to an end i looked at the sea attentively observing and the whole of humanity had returned to mud like unto seaweeds the corpses floated i opened the window and the light smote on my face i was seized with sadness i sat down and i wept and my tears came over my face i looked at the regions bounding the sea toward the twelve points of the horizon not any continent the vessel was borne over the land of nizir the mountains of nizir arrested the vessel and did not permit it to pass over a day and a second day the mountain of nizir arrested the vessel and did not permit it to pass over the third and fourth day the mountain of nizir arrested the vessel and did not permit it to pass over the fifth and sixth day the mountain of nizir arrested the vessel and did not permit it to pass over at the approach of the seventh day i sent out and loosed a dove the dove went turned and found no place to light on and it came back i sent out and loosed a swallow the swallow went turned and found no place to light on and it came back i sent out and loosed a raven the raven went and saw the corpses on the waters it ate rested turned and came not back i then sent out what was in the vessel toward the four winds and i offered a sacrifice i raised the pile of my burnt offering on the peak of the mountain seven by seven i disposed the measured vases and beneath i spread rushes cedar and juniper wood the gods were seized with the desire of it the gods were seized with a benevolent desire of it and the gods assembled like flies over the master of the sacrifice from afar in approaching the great goddess raised the great zones that anu had made for their glory the gods these gods luminous crystal before me i will never leave them in that day i pray that i might never leave them let the gods come to my sacrificial pile but never may bel come to my sacrificial pile for he did not master himself and he has made the water spout for the deluge and he has numbered my men for the pit from far in drawing near bel saw the vessel and bel stopped he was filled with anger against the gods and the celestial archangels no one shall come out alive no man shall be preserved from the abyss adar opened his mouth and said he said to the warrior bel what other than ea should have formed this resolution for ea possesses knowledge and he foresees all ea opened his mouth and spake he said to the warrior bel o thou herald of the gods warrior as thou didst not master thyself thou hast made the water spout of the deluge let the sinner carry the weight of his sins the blasphemer the weight of his blasphemy please thyself with this good pleasure and it shall never be infringed faith in it never shall be violated instead of thy making a new deluge let lions appear and reduce the number of men instead of thy making a new deluge let hyenas appear and reduce the number of men instead of thy making a new deluge let there be famine and let the earth be devastated instead of thy making a new deluge 
let dibbara appear and let men be mown down i have not revealed the decision of the great gods it is khasi satra who interpreted a dream and comprehended what the gods had decided then when his resolve was arrested bel entered into the vessel he took my hand and made me rise he made my wife rise and made her place herself at my side he turned around us and stopped short he approached our group until now khasisatra has made part of perishable humanity but lo now khasisatra and his wife are going to be carried away to live like the gods and khasisatra will reside afar at the mouth of the rivers they carried me away and established me in a remote place at the mouth of the streams this narrative says lenormand follows with great exactness the same course as that or rather as those of genesis and the analogies are on both sides striking when we consider these two forms of the same legend we see many points wherein the story points directly to atlantis one in the first place berisus tells us that the god who gave warning of the coming of the deluge was chronos chronos it is well known was the same as saturn saturn was the ancient king of italy who far anterior to the founding of rome introduced civilization from some other country to the italians he established industry and social order filled the land with plenty and created the golden age of italy he was suddenly removed to the abodes of the gods his name is connected in the mythological legends with a great saturnian continent in the atlantic ocean and a great kingdom which in the remote ages embraced northern africa and the european coast of the mediterranean as far as the peninsula of italy and quote, certain islands in the sea end quote, agreeing in this respect with the story of plato as to the dominions of atlantis the romans called the atlantic ocean cronium mare the sea of chronos thus identifying chronos with that ocean the pillars of hercules were also called by the ancients quote, the pillars of chronos end quote. here then we have convincing testimony that the country referred to in the chaldean legends was the land of chronos or saturn the ocean world the dominion of atlantis two hea or ea the god of the nineveh tablets was a fish god he was represented in the chaldean monuments as half man and half fish he was described as the god not of the rivers and seas but of quote, the abyss end quote, to wit the ocean he it was who was said to have brought civilization and letters to the ancestors of the assyrians he clearly represented an ancient maritime civilized nation he came from the ocean and was associated with some land and people that had been destroyed by rain and inundations the fact that the scene of the deluge is located on the euphrates proves nothing for we will see hereafter that almost every nation had its especial mountain on which according to its traditions the ark rested just as every greek tribe had its own particular mountain of olympus the god bel of the legend was the baal of the phoenicians who as we shall show were of atlantean origin bel or baal was worshipped on the western and northern coasts of europe and gave his name 
to the Baltic, the Great and Little Belt, Balisbaugen, Balistranden, etc., and to many localities in the British Isles, as, for instance, Bellin and the Ball Hills in Yorkshire. 3. In those respects, where in the Chaldean legend, evidently the older form of the tradition differs from the biblical record, we see that in each instance we approach nearer to Atlantis. The account given in Genesis is the form of the tradition that would be natural to an inland people. Although there is an allusion to, quote, the breaking up of the fountains of the great deep, end quote, about which I will speak more fully hereafter, the principal destruction seems to have been accomplished by rain, hence the greater period allowed for the deluge, to give time enough for the rain to fall, and subsequently drain off from the land. A people dwelling in the midst of a continent could not conceive the possibility of a whole world sinking beneath the sea. They therefore supposed the destruction to have been caused by a continuous downpour of rain for forty days and forty nights. In the Chaldean legend, on the contrary, the rain lasted but seven days. We see that the writer had a glimpse of the fact that the destruction occurred in the midst of or near the sea. The Ark of Genesis, Teba, was simply a chest, a coffer, a big box, such as might be imagined by an inland people. The Ark of the Chaldeans was a veritable ship. It had a prow, a helm, and a pilot, and men to manage it, and it navigated, quote, the sea, end quote. For the Chaldean legend represents not a mere rainstorm, but a tremendous cataclysm. There was rain, it is true, but there was also thunder, lightning, earthquakes, wind, a water spout, and a devastation of mountain and land by the war of the elements. All the dreadful forces of nature were fighting together over the doomed land. Quote, the archangel of the abyss brought destruction. The water rose to the sky. The brother no longer saw his brother. Men no longer knew each other. End quote. The men, quote, filled the sea like fishes. End quote. The sea was filled with mud. And, quote, the corpses floated like seaweed. End quote. When the storm abated, the land had totally disappeared. There was no longer, quote, any continent, end quote. Does not all this accord with, quote, the dreadful day and night, end quote, described by Plato? 5. In the original, it appears that Istubar, when he started to find the deified Khasisatra, traveled first for nine days' journey to the sea, then secured the services of a boatman, and, entering a ship, sailed for fifteen days before finding the chaldean noah this would show that khasisatra dwelt in a far country one only attainable by crossing the water and this too seemed like a reminiscence of the real sight of atlantis the sea which a sailing vessel required fifteen days to cross must have been a very large body of water in fact an ocean end of part two chapter three end of section ten section eleven part two chapter four of Atlantis, the Antediluvian World by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Atlantis, the Antediluvian World by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. Chapter 4 The Deluge Legends of Other Nations. 
A collection of the deluge legends of other nations will throw light upon the biblical and Chaldean records of that great event. The author of the treatise On the Syrian Goddess acquaints us with the diluvian tradition of the Arameans, directly derived from that of Chaldea, as it was narrated in the celebrated sanctuary of Hieriopolis, or Bambais. The generality of people, he says, tells us that the founder of the temple was Deucalion Sisythes, that Deucalion in whose time the great inundation occurred. I have also heard the account given by the Greeks themselves of Deucalion. The myth runs thus. The actual race of men is not the first, for there was a previous one, all the members of which perished. We belong to a second race, descended from Deucalion, and multiplied in the course of time. As to the former men, they are said to have been full of insolence and pride, committing many crimes, disregarding their oath, neglecting the rights of hospitality, unsparing to suppliants. Accordingly, they were punished by an immense disaster. All on a sudden, enormous volumes of water issued from the earth, and rains of extraordinary abundance began to fall. The rivers left their beds, and the sea overflowed its shores. The whole earth was covered with water, and all men perished. Deucalion alone, because of his virtue and piety, was preserved alive to give birth to a new race. This is how he was saved. He placed himself, his children, and his wives in a great coffer that he had, in which pigs, horses, lions, serpents, and all other terrestrial animals came to seek refuge with him. He received them all, and while they were in the coffer, Zeus inspired them with reciprocal amity, which prevented their devouring one another. In this manner, shut up within one single coffer, they floated as long as the waters remained in force. Such is the account given by the Greeks of Deucalion. But to this, which they equally tell, the people of Hieriopolis add a marvellous narrative, that in their country a great chasm opened into which all the waters of the deluge poured. Then Deucalion raised an altar and dedicated a temple to Hera, at Argatis, close to this very chasm. I have seen it. It is very narrow and situated under the temple. Whether it was once large and has now shrunk I do not know, but I have seen it, and it is quite small. In memory of the event the following is the rite accomplished. Twice a year sea-water is brought to the temple. This is not only done by the priests, but numerous pilgrims come from the whole of Syria and Arabia, and even from beyond the Euphrates, bringing water. It is poured out in the temple and goes into the cleft, which, narrow as it is, swallows up a considerable quantity. This is said to be in virtue of religious law instituted by Deucalion to preserve the memory of the catastrophe, and of the benefits that he received from the gods. Such is the ancient tradition of the temple. It appears to me difficult, says Lenormant, not to recognize an echo of fables popular in all Semitic countries about this chasm of Hieriopolis, and the part it played in the deluge, in the enigmatic expressions of the Koran respecting the oven, Tanur, which began to bubble and disgorge water all around at the commencement of the deluge. We know that this Tanur has been the occasion of most grotesque imaginings of Muslim commentators who had lost the tradition of the story to which Mohammed made allusion. And moreover, the Koran formally states that the waters of the deluge were absorbed in the bosom of the earth. Here the Zisuthros of Barossus becomes Deucalion Sisythes. The animals are not collected together by Deucalion, as in the case of Noah and Cassisatra, but they crowded into the vessel of their own accord, driven by the terror with which the storm had inspired them. As in great calamities, the creatures of the forest have been known to seek refuge in the houses of men. India affords us an account of the deluge which, by its poverty, strikingly contrasts with that of the Bible and the Chaldeans. Its most simple and ancient form is found in the Satapatha Brahmana of the Rig Veda. It has been translated for the first time by Max Müller. One morning, water for washing was brought to Manu and when he had washed himself, a fish remained in his hands, and it addressed these words to him, Protect me, and I will save thee. From what wilt thou save me? A deluge will sweep all creatures away. It is from that I will save thee. How shall I protect thee? The fish replied, While we are small we run great dangers, for fish swallow fish. Keep me at first in a vase. When I become too large for it, dig a basin to put me in. When I shall have grown still more, Throw me into the ocean, then I shall be preserved from destruction. Soon it grew a large fish. It said to Manu, The very year I shall have reached my full growth, the deluge will happen. Then build a vessel and worship me. 
When the waters rise, enter the vessel, and I will save thee. After keeping him thus, Manu carried the fish to the sea. In the year indicated, Manu built a vessel and worshipped the fish, and when the deluge came he entered the vessel. Then the fish came swimming up to him, and man fastened the cable of the ship to the horn of the fish, by which means the latter made it pass over the mountain of the north. The fish said, I have saved thee. Fasten the vessel to a tree, that the water may not sweep it away, while thou art on the mountain, and in proportion as the waters decrease, thou shalt descend. Manu descended with the waters, and this is what is called the descent of Manu on the mountain of the north. The deluge had carried away all creatures, and Manu remained alone. There is another form of the Hindu legend in the Puranas. Lenormant says, We must also remark that in the Puranas it is no longer Manu Vaivasata that the divine fish saves from the deluge, but a different personage, the king of the Dastas, i.e. fisher, Satiravata, the man who loves justice and truth, strikingly corresponding to the Chaldean Kasisatra. Nor is the Puranic version of the legend of the deluge to be despised, though it be of recent date, and full of fantastic and often puerile details. In certain aspects it is less Aryanized than that of the Ramana or than the Mahabharata, and above all it gives some circumstances omitted in these earlier versions, which must yet have belonged to the original foundation, since they appear in the Babylonian legend, a circumstance preserved no doubt by the oral tradition, popular and not Brahmanic, with which the Puranas are so deeply imbued. This has already been observed by Pictet, who lays due stress on the following passage of the Bhagavata Purana. In seven days, said Vishnu to Satyravata, the three worlds shall be submerged. There is nothing like this in the Brahmana, nor the Mahabharata, but in Genesis the Lord said to Noah, Yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth. And a little farther we read, After seven days the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Nor must we pay less attention to the directions given by the fish-god, to Satyravata, for the placing of the sacred scriptures in a safe place in order to preserve them from the Hayagriva, a marine horse dwelling in the abyss. We recognize in it, under an Indian garb, the very tradition of the interment of the sacred writings at Sipara by Kasisatra, such as we have seen it in the fragment of Berosus. The references to the three worlds and the fish-god in these legends point to Atlantis. The three worlds probably refers to the great empire of Atlantis, described by Plato, to wit, the western continent America, the eastern continent, Europe and Africa, considered as one, and the island of Atlantis. As we have seen, Poseidon, the founder of the civilization of Atlantis, is identical with Neptune, who is always represented riding a dolphin, bearing a trident or three-pronged symbol in his hand, emblematic, probably, of the triple kingdom. He is thus a sea-god or fish-god, and he comes to save the representative of his country. And we have also a new and singular form of the legend in the following. Lenormant says, Among the Iranians, in the sacred books containing the fundamental Zoroastrian doctrines, and dating very far back, we meet with a tradition which must assuredly be looked upon as a variety of that of the deluge, though possessing a special character and diverging in some essential particulars from those we have been examining. It relates how Yima, who in the original and primitive conception was the father of the human race, was warned by Ahura Mazda, the good deity, of the earth being about to be devastated by a flood. The god ordered Yima to construct a refuge, a square garden, Vara, protected by an enclosure, and to cause the germs of men, beasts, and plants to enter it, in order to escape annihilation. Accordingly, when the inundation occurred, the garden of Yima, with all that it contained, was alone spared, and the message of safety was brought thither by the bird Karshipta, the envoy of Ahura Mazda. Venudid, Volume 2, page 46. This clearly signifies that prior to the destruction of Atlantis, a colony had been sent out to some neighboring country. These emigrants built a walled town, and brought to it the grains and domestic animals of the mother country, and when the island of Atlantis sunk in the ocean, a messenger brought the terrible tidings to them in a ship. The Greeks had two principal legends as to the cataclysm by which primitive humanity was destroyed. The first was connected with the name of Ogigas, the most ancient of the kings of Boeotia or Attica, a quite mythical personage, lost in the night of ages, his very name seemingly derived from one signifying deluge in Aryan idioms, in Sanskrit, Anga. 
It is said that in his time the whole land was covered by a flood, whose waters reached the sky, and from which he, together with some companions, escaped in a vessel. The second tradition is the Thessalian legend of Deucalion. Zeus, having worked to destroy the men of the Age of Bronze, with whose crimes he was wroth, Deucalion, by the advice of Prometheus, his father, constructed a coffer in which he took refuge with his wife, Pyrrha. The deluge came, the chest or coffer floated at the mercy of the waves for nine days and nine nights, and was finally stranded on Mount Parnassus. Deucalion and Pyrrha leave it, offer sacrifice, and according to the command of Zeus, repeople the world by throwing behind them the bones of the earth, namely stones, which change into men. This deluge of Deucalion is, in Grecian tradition, what most resembles a universal deluge. Many authors affirm that it extended to the whole earth, and that the whole human race perished. At Athens, in memory of the event, and to appease the manes of its victims, a ceremony called hydrophoria was observed, having so close a resemblance to that in use at Hierapolis in Syria, that we can hardly fail to look upon it as a Syro-Phoenician importation, and the result of an assimilation established in remote antiquity between the deluge of Deucalion and that of Cassisatra as described by the author of the treatise on the Syrian goddess. Close to the temple of the Olympian Zeus, a fissure in the soil was shown, in length but one cubit, through which it was said the waters of the deluge had been swallowed up. Thus every year, on the third day of the festival of Anthisteria, a day of mourning consecrated to the dead, that is, on the thirteenth of the month of Anthisterion, toward the beginning of March, it was customary, as at Bambais, took pour water into the fissure, together with flour mixed with honey, poured also into the trench dug to the west of the tomb in the funeral sacrifices of the Athenians. In this legend also there are passages which point to Atlantis. We will see hereafter that the Greek god Zeus was one of the kings of Atlantis. The men of the Age of Bronze indicates the civilization of the doomed people. They were the great metallurgists of their day who, as we will see, were probably the source of the great number of implements and weapons of bronze found all over Europe. Here also, while no length of time is assigned to the duration of the storm, we find that the ark floated but nine days and nights. Noah was one year and ten days in the ark. Cassisatra was not half that time, while Deucalion was afloat only nine days. At Megara, in Greece, it was the eponym of the city Megaros, son of Zeus and one of the nymphs, Sithnides, who, warned by the cry of cranes of the imminence of the danger of the coming flood, took refuge on Mount Geranion. Again, there was the Thessalian Sarambos, who was said to have escaped the flood by rising into the air on wings given him by the nymphs, and it was Perorus, son of Aeolus, that Zeus Naios had preserved at Dodona. For the inhabitants of the Isle of Kos, the hero of the deluge was Merops, son of Hyas, who there assembled under his rule the remnant of humanity preserved with him. The traditions of Rhodes only supposed the Telchines, those of Crete Sazion, to have escaped the cataclysm. In Samothracia, the same character was attributed to Saon, said to be the son of Zeus or of Hermes. It will be observed that in all these legends the name of Zeus, king of Atlantis, reappears. It would appear probable that many parties had escaped from the catastrophe, and had landed at the different points named in the traditions, or else that colonies had already been established by the Atlanteans at those places. It would appear impossible that a maritime people could be totally destroyed. Doubtless many were on shipboard in the harbors, and others going and coming on distant voyages. The invasion of the East, says Baldwin, Prehistoric Nations, page 396, to which the story of Atlantis refers, seems to have given rise to the Panathenae, the oldest, greatest, and most splendid festivals in honor of Athena celebrated in Attica. These festivals are said to have been established by Erichthonus in the most ancient times remembered by the historical traditions of Athens. Burke says of them, in his commentary on Plato, In the greater Panathenae there was carried in procession a peplum of Minerva, representing the war with the giants and the victory of the gods of Olympus. In the lesser Panathenae they carried another peplum, covered with symbolic devices, which showed how the Athenians, supported by Minerva, had the advantage in the war with the Atlantis. A scolia quoted from Proclus by Humboldt and Burke says, The historians who speak of the islands of the exterior sea tell us that in their time there were seven islands consecrated to Proserpine, and three others of immense extent, of which the first was consecrated to Pluto, the second to Ammon, and the third to Neptune. 
the inhabitants of the latter had preserved a recollection, transmitted to them by their ancestors, of the island of Atlantis, which was extremely large, and for a long time held sway over all the islands of the Atlantic Ocean. Atlantis was also consecrated to Neptune. See Humboldt's Histoire de la Géographie du Nouveau Continent, Volume 1. No one can read these legends and doubt that the flood was an historical reality. It is impossible that in two different places in the old world, remote from each other, religious ceremonies should have been established and perpetuated from age to age in memory of an event which never occurred. We have seen that at Athens and Hierapolis in Syria, pilgrims came from a distance to appease the god of the earthquake by pouring offerings into fissures of the earth said to have been made at the time Atlantis was destroyed. More than this, we know from Plato's history that the Athenians long preserved in their books the memory of a victory won over the Atlanteans in the early ages, and celebrated it by national festivals, with processions and religious ceremonies. It is too much to ask us to believe that biblical history, Chaldean, Iranian, and Greek legends signify nothing, and that even religious pilgrimages and national festivities were based upon a myth. I would call attention to the farther fact that in the deluge legend of the Isle of Kos, the hero of the affair was Merops. Now we have seen that according to Theopompus, one of the names of the people of Atlantis was Meropes. But we have not reached the end of our flood legends. The Persian Magi possessed a tradition in which the waters issued from the oven of an old woman. Muhammad borrowed this story, and in the Koran he refers to the deluge as coming from an oven. All men were drowned save Noah and his family, and then God said, O earth, swallow up thy waters, and thou, O heaven, withhold thy rain. And immediately the waters abated. In the Bardic poems of Wales we have a tradition of the deluge which, although recent, under the concise forms of the triads, is still deserving of attention. As usual the legend is localized in the country, and the deluge counts among three terrible catastrophes of the island of Pridian, or Britain the other two consisting of devastation by fire and by drought. The first of these events, it is said, was the eruption of Jin Jilion, or the Lake of Waves, and the inundation, Bavd, of the whole country, by which all mankind was drowned, with the exception of Dvifam and Dvifach, who saved themselves in a vessel without rigging, and it was by them that the island of Pridium was repeopled. Pictet here observes, Although the triads in their actual form hardly date farther than the 13th or 14th century, some of them are undoubtedly connected with very ancient traditions, and nothing here points to a borrowing from Genesis. But it is not so, perhaps, with another triad, speaking of the vessel Nefidnaf Nefion, which at the time of the overflow of Jion Gion, bore a pair of all living creatures, and rather too much resembles the Ark of Noah. The very name of the patriarch may have suggested this triple epithet, obscure as to its meaning, but evidently formed on the principle of Simric alliteration. In the same triad we have the enigmatic story of the horned oxen, Uchain Banov, of Hu the Mighty, who drew out of Jion the Avank, beaver or crocodile, in order that the lake should not overflow. The meaning of these enigmas could only be hoped from deciphering the chaos of barbaric monuments of the Welsh Middle Age, but meanwhile we cannot doubt that the Simri possessed an indigenous tradition of the deluge. We also find a vestige of the same tradition in the Scandinavian Ealda. Here the story is combined with the cosmogonic myth. The three sons of Bor, Otin, Vili, and Ve, grandsons of Buri, the first man, slay Ymir, the father of the Hrimthursa, or ice giants, and his body serves them for the construction of the world. Blood flows from his wounds in such abundance that all the race of giants is drowned in it except Bergelmir, who saves himself with his wife in a boat and reproduces the race. In the Edda of Zimund, the Vala's prophecy, we seem to catch traditional glimpses of a terrible catastrophe which reminds us of the Chaldean legend. Then trembles Yggdrasil's ash yet standing, groans that ancient tree, and the Yurta and Loki is loosed. The shadows groan on the ways of Hel, the goddess of death, until the fire of Surt has consumed the tree. Hurm steers from the east, the waters rise, the mundane snake is coiled in Yurta and rage. The worm beats the water and the eagle screams, the pale of beak tears carcasses, 
the ship Nalgfar is loosed. Surt from the south comes with flickering flame, shines from his sword the Valgod's sun. The stony hills are dashed together, the giantesses totter, men tread the path of Hel, and heaven is cloven. The sun darkens, earth in ocean sinks, fall from heaven the bright stars. Fire's breath assails the all-nourishing, towering fire plays against heaven itself. Egypt does not contain a single allusion to the flood. Lenormand says, While the tradition of the deluge holds so considerable a place in the legendary memories of all branches of the Aryan race, the monuments and original texts of Egypt, with their many cosmogonic speculations, have not afforded one even distant allusion to this cataclysm. When the Greeks told the Egyptian priests of the deluge of Deucalion, their reply was that they had been preserved from it, as well as from the conflagration produced by Phaethon. They even added that the Hellenes were childish in attaching so much importance to that event, as there had been several other local catastrophes resembling it. According to a passage in Manetho, much suspected, however, of being an interpolation, Thoth, or Hermes Trismegistus, had himself before the cataclysm inscribed on stele, in hieroglyphical and sacred language, the principles of all knowledge. After it, the second Thoth translated into the vulgar tongue the contents of these stele. This would be the only Egyptian mention of the deluge, the same Manetho not speaking of it in what remains to us of his dynasties, his only complete authentic work. The silence of all other myths of the pharaonic religion on this head render it very likely that the above is merely a foreign tradition, recently introduced, and no doubt of Asiatic and Chaldean origin. To my mind, the explanation of this singular omission is very plain. The Egyptians had preserved in their annals the precise history of the destruction of Atlantis, out of which the flood legends grew. And as they told the Greeks, there had been no universal flood, but only local catastrophes. Possessing the real history of the local catastrophe which destroyed Atlantis, they did not indulge in any myths about a universal deluge covering the mountain tops of all the world. They had no Ararat in their neighborhood. The traditions of the early Christian ages touching the deluge pointed to the quarter of the world in which Atlantis was situated. There was a quaint old monk named Cosmos, who about one thousand years ago published a book, Topographia Christiana, accompanied by a map in which he gives his view of the world as it was then understood. It was a body surrounded by water and resting on nothing. The earth, says Cosmos, presses downward, but the igneous parts tend upward and between the conflicting forces the earth hangs suspended, like Muhammad's coffin in the old story. The accompanying illustration, page 95, represents the earth surrounded by the ocean, and beyond this ocean was the land where men dwelt before the deluge. He then gives us a more accurate map in detail of the known world of his day. I copy this map not to show how much more we know than poor Cosmos, but because he taught that all around this habitable world, there was yet another world, adhering closely on all sides to the circumscribing walls of heaven. Upon the eastern side of this transmarine land he judges man was created, and that there the paradise of gladness was located, such as here on the eastern edge is described, where it received our first parents, driven out of paradise, to that extreme point of land on the seashore. Hence, upon the coming of the deluge, Noah and his sons were borne by the ark to the earth we now inhabit. The four rivers he supposes to be gushing up the spouts of paradise. They are depicted on the above map. O is the Mediterranean Sea, P the Arabian Gulf, L the Caspian Sea, Q the Tigris, M the river Pison, and J the land where men dwelt before the flood. It will be observed that while he locates paradise in the east, he places the scene of the deluge in the west, and he supposes that Noah came from the scene of the deluge to Europe. This shows that the traditions in the time of Cosmos looked to the west as the place of the deluge, and that after the deluge Noah came to the shores of the Mediterranean. The fact, too, that there was land in the west beyond the ocean is recognized by Cosmos, and is probably a dim echo from Atlantean times. The following rude cut from Cosmos represents the high mountain in the north, behind which the sun hid himself at night, thus producing the alterations of day and night. His solar majesty is just getting behind the mountain, while Luna looks calmly on at the operation. The mountain is as crooked as Kulhuacan, the crooked mountain of Atzlan described by the Aztecs. End of chapter 4
Section 12, Part 2, Chapter 5 of Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Harris. Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. Chapter 5 The Deluge Legends of America. It's a very remarkable fact, says Alfred Morey, that we find in America traditions of the deluge coming infinitely nearer to that of the Bible and the Chaldean religion than among any people of the Old World. It's difficult to suppose that the emigration that certainly took place from Asia into North America by the Kuril and Aleutian Islands, and still does so in our day, should have brought in these memories, since no trace is found of them among those Mongol or Siberian populations which were fused with the natives of the New World. The attempts that have been made to trace the origin of Mexican civilization to Asia have not, as yet, led to any sufficiently conclusive facts. Besides, had Buddhism, which we doubt, made its way into America, it could not have introduced a myth not found in its own scriptures. The cause of these similarities between the Diluvian traditions of the nations of the New World and that of the Bible remains, therefore, unexplained. The cause of these similarities can be easily explained. The legends of the flood did not pass into America by way of the Aleutian Islands, or through the Buddhists of Asia, but were derived from an actual knowledge of Atlantis, possessed by the people of America. Atlantis and the western continent had from an immemorial age held intercourse with each other. The great nations of America were simply colonies from Atlantis, sharing in its civilization, language, religion, and blood. From Mexico to the peninsula of Yucatan, from the shores of Brazil to the heights of Bolivia and Peru, from the Gulf of Mexico to the headwaters of the Mississippi River, the colonies of Atlantis extended, and therefore it is not strange to find, as Alfred Morey says, American traditions of the deluge coming nearer to that of the Bible in the Chaldean record than those of any people of the Old World. The most important among the American traditions are the Mexican, for they appear to have been definitively fixed by symbolic and mnemonic paintings before any contact with Europeans. According to these documents, the Noah of the Mexican cataclysm was Coxcox, called by certain people Teosepitli, or Tezpi. He had saved himself, together with his wife, Chuxiquetzal, in a bark, or, according to other traditions, on a raft, made of cypress wood, Cupressus destaca. Paintings retracing the deluge of Coxcox have been discovered among the Aztecs, Miztecs, Zapotecs, Tlaxcaltecs, and Macaho Canises. The tradition of the latter is still more strikingly in conformity with the story as we have it in Genesis and in Chaldean sources. It tells how Tespi embarked in a spacious vessel with his wife, his children, and several animals, and grain whose preservation was essential to the subsistence of the human race. When the great god Tezcatlipoca decreed that the waters should retire, Tezbi sent a vulture from the bark. The bird feeding on the carcasses with which the earth was laden did not return. Tezbi sent out other birds, of which the hummingbird only came back with a leafy branch in its beak. Then Tezbi, seeing that the country began to vegetate, left his bark on the mountain of Colhacoan. The document, however, that gives the most valuable information, says Lenormand, as to the cosmogony of the Mexicans, is one known as Codex Vaticanus, from the library where it is preserved. It consists of four symbolic pictures representing the four ages of the world preceding the actual one. They were copied by Chobula from a manuscript anterior to the conquest, and accompanied by the explanatory commentary of Pedro de los Rios a Dominican monk, who in 1566, less than fifty years after the arrival of Cortes, devoted himself to the research of indigenous traditions, as being necessary to his missionary work. There were, according to this document, four ages of the world. The first was an age of giants, the great Mammalia, who were destroyed by famine. The second age ended in a conflagration. The third age was an age of monkeys. Then comes the fourth age, Antonatui, son of water, 
whose number is ten times four hundred plus eight, or four thousand eight. It ends by a great inundation, a veritable deluge. All mankind are changed into fish, with the exception of one man and his wife, who save themselves in a bark made of the trunk of a cypress tree. The picture represents Matlaque, goddess of waters, and consort of Tlatloc, god of rain, as darting down toward earth. Coxcox and Choquitzel, the two human beings preserved, are seen seated on a tree trunk and floating in the midst of the waters. This flood is represented as the last cataclysm that devastates the earth. The learned Abbe Brasseur de Bourbourg translates from the Aztec language of the Codex Chimalpopica the following flood legend. This is the sun, called Nahuyatl, for water. Now the water was tranquil for forty years plus twelve, and the men lived for the third and fourth times. When the sun, Nahuyatl, came there, had passed away four hundred years plus two ages plus seventy-six years. Then all mankind was lost and drowned, and found themselves changed into fish. The sky came nearer the water. In a single day all was lost, and the day, Nahue Shaktl, four flower, destroyed all our flesh. And that year was that of Chekale, one house, and the day, Nahutatl, all was lost. Even the mountains sunk into the water, and the water remained tranquil for fifty-two springs. Now at the end of the year the god Titlachohan had warned Nata and his spouse Nina, saying, Make no more wine of agave, but begin to hollow out a great cypress, and you will enter into it when in the month Tostantli the water approaches the sky. Then they entered in, and when the god had closed the door, he said, Thou shalt eat but one ear of maize, and thy wife one also. But as soon as they had finished they went out, and the water remained calm, for the wood no longer moved, and on opening it they began to see fish. Then they lit a fire by rubbing together pieces of wood, and they roasted fish. The god Kitalanque and Sitalantanak instantly looked down, said, Divine Lord, what is that fire that is making there? Why do they thus smoke the sky? At once Titlachuan Tezcatlipoaca descended. He began to chide, saying, Who has made this fire here? And seizing hold of the fish, he shaped their loins and heads, and they were transformed into dogs. Chichem. Here we note a remarkable approximation to Plato's account of the destruction of Atlantis. In one day and one fatal night, says Plato, there came mighty earthquakes and inundations that engulfed that warlike people. In a single day all was lost, says the Aztec legend. And instead of a rainfall of forty days and forty nights, as represented in the Bible, here we see, in a single day, even the mountains sunk into the water. Not only the land on which the people dwelt who were turned into fish, but the very mountains of that land sunk into the water. Does not this describe the fate of Atlantis? In the Chaldean legend, the great goddess Ishtar wailed like a child, saying, I am the mother who gave birth to men, and... Like to the race of fishes, they are filling the sea. In the account in Genesis, Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. In the Chaldean legend we are told that Kashsistra also offered a sacrifice, a burnt offering, and the gods assembled like flies above the master of the sacrifice. But Bel came in a high state of indignation, just as the Aztec god did, and was about to finish the work of the deluge when the great god Ea took pity in his heart and interfered to save the remnant of mankind. These resemblances cannot be accidental, neither can they be the interpolations of Christian missionaries, for it will be observed the Aztec legends differ from the Bible, in points where they resemble, on the one hand, Plato's record, and on the other, the Chaldean legend. The name of the hero of the Aztec story, Nata, pronounced with the broad sound of the A, is not far from the name of Noah, or Noe. The deluge of Genesis is a Phoenician, Semitic, 
or Hebraic legend, and yet, strange to say, the name of Noah, which occurs in it, bears no appropriate meaning in those tongues, but is derived from Aryan sources. Its fundamental root is Na, to which in all the Aryan language is attached the meaning of water, Greek Nain, to flow, Greek Nama, water, Nympha, Neptunus, water deities, Lenormand and Chevalier, Ancient History of the East, Volume 1, page 15. We find the root Na repeated in the name of this Central American Noah, Nata, and probably in the word Nahuatl, the age of water. But still more striking analogies exist between the Chaldean legend and the story of the deluge, as told in the Popol Vuh, the sacred book of the Central Americans. Then the waters were agitated by the will of the heart of heaven, Hurakan, and a great inundation came upon the heads of these creatures. They were engulfed, and a resinous thickness descended from heaven. The face of the earth was obscured, and a heavy darkening rain commenced, rain by day and rain by night. There was heard a great noise above their heads, as if produced by fire. Then there were men seen running, pushing each other, filled with despair. They wished to climb upon their houses, and the houses tumbling down fell to the ground. They wished to climb upon the trees, and the trees shook them off. They wished to enter into the grottoes, eaves, and the grottoes closed themselves before them. Water and fire contributed to the universal ruin at the time of the last great cataclysm which preceded the fourth creation. Observe the similarities here to the Chaldean legend. There is the same graphic description of a terrible event. The black cloud is referred to in both instances. Also the dreadful noises, the rising water, the earthquake rocking the trees, overturning the houses, and crushing even the mountain caverns. The men running and pushing each other, filled with despair, says the Popol Vuh. The brother no longer saw his brother, says the Assyrian legend. And here I may note that this word Hurakan, the spirit of the abyss, the god of storm, the hurricane, is very suggestive, and testifies to an early intercourse between the opposite shores of the Atlantic. We find in Spanish the word Hurakan, in Portuguese, Furakan, in French, Uragan, in German, Danish, and Swedish, Orkan, all of them signifying a storm, while in Latin, Furo, or furio means to rage, and are not the old Swedish hura to be driven along, our own word hurried, the Icelandic word hura to be rattled over frozen ground, all derived from the same root from which the god of the abyss, Hurakan, obtained his name? The last thing a people forgets is the name of their god. We retain to this day, in the names of the days of the week, the designations of four Scandinavian gods and one Roman deity. It seems to me certain the above are simply two versions of the same event, that while ships from Atlantis carried terrified passengers to tell the story of the dreadful catastrophe to the people of the Mediterranean shores, other ships flying from the tempest bore similar awful tidings to the civilized races around the Gulf of Mexico. The native Mexican historian, Ixtiltilchocl, gave this as the Toltec legend of the flood. It is found in the histories of the Toltecs that this age and first world, as they called it, lasted 1,716 years, and that men were destroyed by tremendous rains and lightning from the sky, and even all the land, without the exception of anything, and the highest mountains, were covered up and submerged in water fifteen cubits deep. And here they added other fables of how men came to multiply from the few who escaped from this destruction, in a toplipetlakali, that this word nearly signifies a close chest, and how, after men had multiplied, they erected a very high zuquali, which is to-day a tower of great height, in order to take refuge in it should the second world or age be destroyed. Presently their languages were confused, and, not being able to understand each other, they went to different parts of the earth. The Toltecs, consisting of seven friends with their wives, who understood the same language, came to these parts, having first passed great land and seas, having lived in caves, and having endured great hardships in order to reach this land. They wandered one hundred four years through different parts of the world before they reached Huehuetlapalan which is in Chetecpatl, 
five hundred twenty years after the flood. It will, of course, be said that this account, in those particulars where it agrees with the Bible, was derived from the teachings of the Spanish priests. But it must be remembered that Ixtlachitl was an Indian, a native of Tezuoco, a son of the Queen, and that his relaciones were drawn from the archives of his family and the ancient writings of his nation. He had no motive to falsify documents that were probably in the hands of hundreds at that time. Here we see that the depth of the water over the earth, fifteen cubits, given in the Toltec legend, is precisely the same as that named in the Bible. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, that from Genesis chapter 7, page 20. In the two curious picture histories of the Aztecs, preserved in Botorini collection, and published by Gemelli Carreri and others, there is a record of their migrations from their original location through various parts of the North American continent until their arrival in Mexico. In both cases their starting point is an island, from which they pass in a boat, and the island contains in one case a mountain, and in the other a high temple in the midst thereof. These things seem to be reminiscences of their origin in Atlantis. In each case we see the crooked mountain of the Aztec legends, the Colcoacan, looking not unlike the bent mountain of the monk Cosmos. In the legends of the Chibchas of Bogota we seem to have distinct reminiscences of Atlantis. Bochica was there, leading divinity. During two thousand years he employed himself in elevating his subjects. He lived in the sun, while his wife Chia occupied the moon. This would appear to be an allusion to the worship of the sun and moon. Beneath Bochica, in their mythology, was Chipchuan. In an angry mood he brought a deluge on the people of the tableland. Bochica punished him for this act, and obliged him ever after, like Atlas, to bear the burden of the earth on his back. Occasionally he shifts the earth from one shoulder to another, and this causes earthquakes. Here we have allusions to an ancient people who during thousands of years were elevated in the scale of civilization, and were destroyed by a deluge, and with this is associated an Atlantean god bearing the world on his back. We find even the rainbow appearing in connection with this legend. When Bochica appeared in answer to prayer to quell the deluge, he is seated on a rainbow. He opened a breach in the earth at Tequendama, through which the waters of the flood escaped, precisely as we have seen them disappearing through the crevice in the earth near Bambis in Greece. The Toltecs traced their migrations back to a starting point called Aztlan, or Atlan. This could be no other than Atlantis. This is from Bancroft's Native Races, volume 5, page 221. The original home of the Nahutlaks was Aztlan, the location of which has been the subject of much discussion. The causes that led to their exodus from that country can only be conjectured but they may be supposed to have been driven out by their enemies, for Aztlan is described as a land too fair and beautiful to be left willingly in the mere hope of finding a better. Again from Bancroft. The Aztecs also claim to have come originally from Aztlan. Their very name, Aztecs, was derived from Aztlan, and they were Atlanteans. The Popple View tells us that after the migration from Aztlan, three sons of the king of the Quiches, upon the death of their father, determined to go as their fathers had ordered, to the east, on the shores of the sea whence their fathers had come, to receive the royalty, bidding adieu to their brothers and friends, and promising to return. Doubtless they passed over the sea when they went to the east to receive the royalty. Now this is the name of the Lord, of the monarch of the people of the east, where they went. And when they arrived before the Lord Nakchit, the name of the great Lord, the only judge whose power was without limit, Behold, he granted them the sign of royalty in all that represents it, and the insignia of royalty, all the things, in fact, which they brought on their return, and which they went to receive from the other side of the sea, the art of painting from Tulan, a system of writing, they said, for the things recorded in their histories. It is from Bancroft's Native Races, volume 5, page 553, and the Popple View, page 294. This legend not only points to the east as the place of origin of these races, but also proves that this land of the east, this Aztlan, this Atlantis, exercised dominion over the colonies in Central America, and furnished them with the essentials of civilization. How completely does this agree with the statement of Plato 
that the kings of Atlantis held a dominion over parts of the great opposite continent. Professor Valentini, in Maya Archaeology, page 23, describes an Aztec picture in the work of Gamelli, Il Giro del Mondo, volume 6, of the migration of the Aztecs from Aztlan. Out of a sheet of water there projects the beak of a mountain. On it stands a tree, and on the tree a bird spreads its wings. At the foot of the mountain peak there comes out of the water the heads of a man and a woman. The one wears on his head the symbol of his name, Coxcox, a pheasant. The other head bears that of a hand with a bouquet, Chukchitl, a flower, and Quetzal, shining in green gold. In the foreground is a boat out of which a naked man stretches out his hand imploringly to heaven. Now turn to the sculpture in the flood tablet on the great calendar stone. There you'll find represented the flood, and with great emphasis by the accumulation of all those symbols with which the ancient Mexicans conveyed the idea of water. A tub of standing water, drops springing out, not two, as heretofore in the symbol for atl, water, but four drops, the picture for moisture, a snail, above a crocodile, the king of the rivers. In the midst of these symbols you notice the profile of a man with a fillet, and a smaller one of a woman. There can be no doubt these are the Mexican Noah, Coxcox, and his wife, Chuckchquetzal, and at the same time it's evident, the calendar stone we know was made in A.D. 1478, that the story of them, and the pictures representing the story, have not been invented by the Catholic clergy, but really existed among those nations long before the conquest. The above figure represents the flood tablets on the great calendar stone. When we turn to the uncivilized Indians of America, while we still find legends referring to the deluge, they are, with one exception, in such garbled and uncouth forms that we can only see glimpses of the truth shining through a mass of fable. The following tradition was current among the Indians of the Great Lakes. In former times the father of the Indian tribes dwelt toward the rising sun, Having been warned in a dream that a deluge was coming upon the earth, he built a raft on which he saved himself, with his family and all the animals. He floated thus for several months. The animals, who at that time spoke, loudly complained and murmured against him. At last a new earth appeared, on which he landed with all the animals, who from that time lost the power of speech as a punishment for their murmurs against their deliverer. According to Father Charlevoix, the tribes of Canada, and the valley of the Mississippi, relate in their rude legends that all mankind was destroyed by a flood, and that the good spirit, to repeople the earth, had changed animals into man. It is to J. S. Cole, we owe our acquaintance with the version of the Chippeways, full of grotesque and perplexing touches, in which the man saved from the deluge is called Menaboshu. To know if the earth be drying, he sends a bird, the diver, out of his bark, then becomes the restorer of the human race and the founder of the existing society. A clergyman who visited the Indians northwest of the Ohio in 1764 met at a treaty a party of Indians from the west of the Mississippi. They informed him that one of their most ancient traditions was that a great while ago they had a common father, who lived toward the rising of the sun, and governed the whole world, that all the white people's heads were under his feet, that he had twelve sons by whom he administered the government, that the twelve sons behaved very badly, and tyrannized over the people, abusing their power, that the great spirit, being thus angry with them, suffered the white people to introduce spiritous liquors among them, made them drunk, stole the special gift of the great spirit from them, and by this means usurped power over them, and ever since the Indians' heads were under the white people's feet. This from Boudinot's Star in the West, page 111. Here we note that they looked toward the rising sun, toward Atlantis, for the original home of their race, that this region governed the whole world, that it contained white people, who were at first a subject race, but who subsequently rebelled and acquired dominion over the darker races. We will see reason hereafter to conclude that Atlantis had a composite population, and that the rebellion of the Titans in Greek mythology was the rising up of a subject population. End of chapter 5, section 12, part 2, recording by Mike Harris.
Section 13, Part 2, The Deluge, Chapter 5 of Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Harris. Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly, Chapter 5. In 1836, C. S. Raffinesque published in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a work called The American Nations, in which he gives the historical songs, or chants, of the Lenni Lenape, or Delaware Indians, the tribe that originally dwelt along the Delaware River. After describing a time when there was nothing but sea-water on top of the land and the creation of sun, moon, stars, earth, and man, the legend depicts the golden age and the fall in these words. All were willingly pleased, all were easy thinking, all were well happified. But after a while a snake priest, Powako, brings on earth secretly the snake worship, Inetako, of the god of the snakes, Wakan. And there came wickedness, crime, and unhappiness and bad weather was coming, distemper was coming, with death was coming. All this happened very long ago at the first land, Netamaki, beyond the great ocean, Kitahikahu. Then follows the Song of the Flood. There was long ago a powerful snake, Maskanako, when the men had become bad beings, Makowini. This strong snake had become the foe of the jinns, and they became troubled, hating each other. Both were fighting, both were spoiling, both were never peaceful. And they were fighting, least man Matapawi with dead keeper Nikhaulawit, and the strong snake readily resolved to destroy or fight the beings, or the men. The dark snake he brought, the monster, Ananyam, he brought, snake rushing water he brought it, much water is rushing, much go to hills, much penetrate, much destroying. Meanwhile, at Tula, this is the same Tula referred to in the Central American legends, at that island, Nanabush, the great hare Nana, became the ancestor of beings and men. Being born creeping, he is ready to move and dwell at Tula. The beings and men all go forth from the flood, creeping in shallow water or swimming afloat asking which is the way to the turtle-back, Tulapin. But there are many monsters in the way, and some men are devoured by them. But the daughter of a spirit helped them in a boat, saying, Come, come. They were coming and were helped. The name of the boat or raft was Mokol. The water running off it is drying in the plains and the mountains at the path of the cave. Elsewhere went the powerful action or motion. Then follows song number three, describing the condition of mankind after the flood. Like the Aryans, they moved into a cold country. It freezes, was there, it snows, was there, it is cold, was there. They moved to a milder region to hunt cattle. They divided their forces into tillers and hunters. The good and the holy were the hunters. They were spread themselves north, south, east, and west. Meantime all the snakes were afraid in their huts, and the snake-priest Nakopawa said to all, Let us go. Eastwardly they go forth at Snake-land, Akokink, and they went away earnestly grieving. Afterward the fathers of the Delawares, who were always boating and navigating, find that the snake-people have taken possession of a fine country, and they collect together the people from north, south, east, and west, and attempt to pass over the waters of the frozen sea to possess that land. They seem to travel in the dark of an arctic winter until they come to a gap of open sea. They can go no farther. But some tarry at Furland, while the rest return to where they started from, the old turtle land. Here we find that the land that was destroyed was the first land, that it was an island beyond the great ocean. In all early age the people were happy and peaceful. They became wicked. Snake-worship was introduced, and was associated, as in Genesis, with the fall of man. Nanabush became the ancestor of the new race. His name reminds us of the Toltec Nata, and the Hebrew Noah. 
After the flood came a dispersing of the people and a separation into hunters and tillers of the soil. Among the Mandan Indians we not only find flood legends, but more remarkable still, we find an image of the ark preserved from generation to generation, and a religious ceremony performed which refers plainly to the destruction of Atlantis, and to the arrival of one of those who escaped from the flood bringing the dreadful tidings of the disaster. It must be remembered, as we will show hereafter, that many of these Mandan Indians were white men, with hazel, gray, and blue eyes, and all shades of color of the hair, from black to pure white, that they dwelt in houses in fortified towns, and manufactured earthenware pots in which they could boil water, an art unknown to the ordinary Indians who boiled water by putting heated stones into it, I quote the very interesting account of George Catlin, who visited the Mandans nearly fifty years ago, lately republished in London in the North American Indians, a very curious and valuable work. He says in volume 1, page 88, In the center of the village is an open space or public square 150 feet in diameter and circular in form, which is used for all public games and festivals, shows, and exhibitions. The lodges around this open space front in with their doors toward the center, and in the middle of this stands an object of great religious veneration, on account of the importance it has in connection with the annual religious ceremonies. This object is in the form of a large hogshead, some eight or ten feet high, made of planks and hoops, containing within it some of their choicest mysteries or medicines. They call it the Big Canoe. This is a representation of the Ark. The ancient Jews venerated a similar image, and some of the ancient Greek states followed in processions a model of the Ark of Deucalion. But it is indeed surprising to find this practice perpetuated, even to our own times, by a race of Indians in the heart of America. On page 158 of the first volume of the same work, Catlin describes the great annual mysteries and religious ceremonials of which this image of the ark was the center. He says, On the day set apart for the commencement of the ceremonies, a solitary figure is seen approaching the village. During the deafening din and confusion within the pickets of the village, the figure discovered on the prairie continued to approach with a dignified step, and in a right line toward the village. All eyes were upon him, and he at length made his appearance within the pickets, and proceeded toward the center of the village where all the chiefs and braves stood ready to receive him, which they did, in a cordial manner, by shaking hands, recognizing him as an old acquaintance, and pronouncing his name, nu mak muk anna the first or only man. The body of this strange personage, which was chiefly naked, was painted with white clay, so as to resemble at a distance a white man. He enters the medicine lodge, and goes through certain mysterious ceremonies. During the whole of this day, Numak Makana, the first or only man, traveled through the village, stopping in front of each man's lodge, and crying until the owner of the lodge came out and asked who he was and what was the matter, to which he replied by narrating the sad catastrophe which had happened on the earth's surface by the overflowing of the waters, saying that he was the only person saved from the universal calamity, that he landed his big canoe on a high mountain in the west where he now resides, that he has come to open the medicine lodge, which must needs receive a present of an edged tool from the owner of every wigwam, that it may be sacrificed to the water. For, he says, if this is not done, there will be another flood, and no one will be saved, as it was with such tools that the big canoe was made. Having visited every lodge in the village during the day, and having received such a present from each, as a hatchet, a knife, etc., which is undoubtedly always prepared ready for the occasion. He places them in the medicine lodge, and, on the last day of the ceremony, they are thrown into a deep place in the river, sacrificed to the spirit of the waters. Among the sacred articles kept in the great medicine lodge are four sacks of water, called e t ka sewed together, each of them in the form of a tortoise lying on its back, with a bunch of eagle feathers attached to its tail. These four tortoises, they told me, 
contained the waters from the four quarters of the world, that those waters had been contained therein ever since the settling down of the waters. I did not, says Catlin, who knew nothing of an Atlantis theory, think it best to advance anything against such a ridiculous belief. Catlin tried to purchase one of these water sacks, but could not obtain it for any price. He was told they were a society property. He then describes a dance by twelve men around the ark. They arrange themselves according to the four cardinal points. Two are painted perfectly black, two are vermilion color, some were painted partially white. They dance a dance called Belokna Pai, with horns on their heads, like those used in Europe as symbolical of Bel or Baal. Could anything be more evident than the connection of these ceremonies with the destruction of Atlantis? Here we have the image of the ark. Here we have a white man coming with the news that the waters had overflowed the land, and that all the people were destroyed except himself. Here we have the sacrifice to appease the spirit that caused the flood, just as we find the flood terminating, in the Hebrew, Chaldean, and Central American legends, with a sacrifice. Here, too, we have the image of the tortoise, which we find in other flood legends of the Indians, and which is a very natural symbol for an island. As one of our own poets has expressed it, very fair and full of promise lay the island of St. Thomas, like a great green turtle slumbered on the sea which it encumbered. Here we have, too, the four quarters of Atlantis, divided by its four rivers, as we shall see a little farther on, represented in a dance, where the dancers arrange themselves according to the four cardinal points of the compass. The dancers are painted to represent the black and red races, while the first and only man represents the white race, and the name of the dance is a reminiscence of Baal, the ancient god of the races derived from Atlantis. But this is not all. The Mandans were evidently of the race of Atlantis. They have another singular legend which we find in the account of Lewis and Clark. Their belief in a future state is connected with this theory of their origin. The whole nation resided in one large village, underground, near a subterranean lake. A grapevine extended its roots down to their habitation, and gave them a view of the light. Some of the most adventurous climbed up the vine, and were delighted with the sight of the earth which they found covered with buffalo, and rich with every kind of fruit. Returning with the grapes they had gathered, their countrymen were so pleased with the taste of them, that the whole nation resolved to leave their dull residence for the charms of the upper region. Men, women, and children ascended by means of the vine, but, when about half the nation had reached the surface of the earth, a corpulent woman, who was clambering up the vine, broke it with her weight, and closed upon herself and the rest of the nation the light of the sun. This curious tradition means that the present nation dwelt in a large settlement underground, that is, beyond the land, in the sea, the sea being represented by the subterranean lake. At one time the people had free intercourse between this large village and the American continent, and they found extensive colonies on this continent, whereupon some mishap cut them off from the mother country. This explanation is confirmed by the fact that the legend of the Iowa Indians, who were a branch of the Dakotas, or Sioux Indians, and relatives of the Mandans, according to Major James W. Lynn, all the tribes of Indians were formerly one, and all dwelt together on an island, or at least across a large water toward the east or sunrise. They crossed this water in skin canoes or by swimming, but they know not how long they were in crossing, or whether the water was salt or fresh. While the Dakotas, according to Major Lind, who lived among them for nine years, possessed legends of huge skiffs, in which the Dakotas of old floated for weeks, finally gaining dry land, a reminiscence of ships and long sea voyages, the Mandans celebrated their great religious festival above described, in the season when the willow is first in leaf, and a dove is mixed up in the ceremonies. And they further relate a legend that, the world was once a great tortoise born on the waters and covered with earth, and that when one day in a digging the soil a tribe of white men, who had made holes in the earth to a great depth digging for badgers, at length pierced the shell of the tortoise, it sank, and the water covering it drowned all men with the exception of one, who saved himself in a boat. And when the earth re-emerged, sent out a dove, 
who returned with a branch of willow in its beak. The holes dug to find badgers were a savage's recollection of mining operations, and when the great disaster came and the island sunk in the sea amid volcanic convulsions, doubtless men said it was due to the deep mines which had opened the way to the central fires. But the recurrence of white men as the miners, and of a white man as the last and only man, and the presence of white blood in the veins of the people, all point to the same conclusion, that the Mandans were colonists from Atlantis. And here I might add that Catlin found the following singular resemblances between the Mandan tongue and the Welsh. English, I. Mandan, me. Welsh, me. Pronounced, me. English, you. Mandan, ne. Welsh, hui. Pronounced, hwe. English, he. Mandan, e. Welsh, a. Pronounced, a. English, she. Mandan, e. Welsh, e. Pronounced, a. English, it. Mandan, aunt. Welsh, hwint. Pronounced, hwint. English, we. Mandan, nu. Welsh, ni. Pronounced, ne. English, they. Mandan, eona. Welsh, hona. Feminine. Pronounced, hona. English, no, or there is not. Mandan, megosh. Welsh, nagois. Pronounced, nagosh. English, no. Welsh, na. English, head. Mandan, pan. Welsh, pen. Pronounced, pan. English, the great spirit. Mandan, mahopeneta. Welsh, maur penaithir. Pronounced, mosur penaithir. Major Lind also found the following resemblances. Comparison of Dakota, or Sioux, with other languages. Latin, blank. English, see, seen. Saxon, seon. Sanskrit, blank. German, sehen. Danish, sigt. Sioux, sin. Other languages, blank. Primary signification, appearing, visible. Latin, pinso. English, pound. Saxon, punian. Sanskrit, blank. German, blank. Danish, blank. Sioux, pow. Other languages, w. Welsh, poinian. Primary signification, beating. Latin, wado. English, went, wend. Saxon, wenden. Sanskrit, blank. German, blank. Danish, blank. Sioux, winter. Other languages, blank. Primary signification, passage. Latin, blank. English, town. Saxon, tun. Sanskrit, blank. German, town. Danish, tun. Sioux, tonwe. Other languages, Gaelic, dun. Primary signification, blank. Latin, qui. English, who. Saxon, hua. Sanskrit, quas. German, wir. Danish, blank. Sioux, tuwe. Other languages, blank. Primary signification, blank. Latin, blank. English, weapon. Saxon, weapon. Sanskrit, blank. German, wapen. Danish, wapen. Sioux, wipe. Other languages, blank. Primary signification, Sioux, diminutive, wipena. Latin, ego. English, I. Saxon, each. Sanskrit, agam. German, ich. Danish, jeg. Sioux, mish. Other languages, blank. Primary signification, blank. Latin, cor. English, corre. Saxon, blank. Sanskrit, blank. German, blank. Danish, blank. Su, co. Greek, kear. Primary signification, center, heart. Latin, blank. English, eight. Saxon, achte. Sanskrit, aute. German, acht. Danish, otte. Su, shaktogan. Other languages, Greek, octo. Primary signification, blank. Latin, canna. English, cane. 
Saxon blank, Sanskrit blank, German blank, Danish blank, Sioux, can. Other languages, Hebrew, can. Welsh, kaun. Primary signification, reed, weed, wood. Latin, pok. English, pok. Saxon, pok. Sanskrit, blank. German, pokke. Danish, pukkel. Sioux, poka. Other languages, Dutch, poka. Primary signification, swelling. Latin, blank. English, with. Saxon, with. Sanskrit blank, German Vider, Danish blank, Su Wita, other languages, Gothic Gewithan, primary signification blank, Latin blank, English Doughty, Saxon Dohtig, Sanskrit blank, German Taugen, Danish Digtig, Su Dita Ditaya, other languages blank, primary signification hot, brave, daring, Latin blank english tight saxon tian sanskrit blank german dicht danish digt su titan other languages blank primary signification strain latin tango tactus english touch take saxon taiken sanskrit blank german tiken danish tekken su tan htaka other languages blank primary signification touch take latin blank english child saxon child sanskrit blank german kind danish kuld su kin other languages blank primary signification progeny latin blank english work saxon werken sanskrit blank German blank, Danish blank, Su wokas, hekon, other languages, Dutch werk, Spanish echo, primary signification, labor, motion, Latin blank, English shackle, Saxon schokul, Sanskrit blank, German blank, Danish blank, Su schka, other languages, Aramaic, shakala, Dutch shakel, teton, Shakalan. Primary signification to bind a link. Latin blank, English query. Sanskrit blank, German blank, Danish blank. Su, quiva. Other languages blank, primary signification blank. Latin blank, English shabby. Sanskrit blank, German shabig, Danish shabig. Su, shabia. Other languages blank, primary signification blank. According to Major Lind, the Dakotas, or Sioux, belong to the same race as the Mandans, hence the interest which attaches to these verbal similarities. Among the Iroquois there is a tradition that the sea and waters infringed upon the land, so that all human life was destroyed. The Chickasaws assert that the world was once destroyed by water, but that one family was saved and two animals of every kind. The Sioux say there was a time when there was no dry land, and all men had disappeared from existence. C. Lynn's Manuscript History of the Dakotas, Library of Historical Society of Minnesota. The Okanagus have a god, Skyape, and also one called Chacha, who appear to be endowed with omniscience, but their principal divinity is their great mythical ruler and heroine, Skomalt. Long ago, when the sun was no bigger than a star, this strong medicine woman ruled over what appeared to have now become a lost island. At last the peace of the island was destroyed by war, and the noise of battle was heard, with which Skomalt was exceeding wroth, whereupon she rose up in her might and drove her rebellious subjects to one end of the island, and broke off the piece of land on which they were huddled, and pushed it out to sea, to drift whither it would. This floating island was tossed to and fro and buffeted by the winds, till all but two died, a man and a woman escaped in a canoe, and arrived on the mainland. And from there the Okanagus are descended. This from Bancroft's Native Races, volume 3, page 149. Here we have the flood legend clearly connected with a lost island. The Nicaraguans believed that ages ago the world was destroyed by a flood in which the most part of mankind perished. Afterward the Teotes or gods restored the earth, as at the beginning. 
that from page 75 of Bancroft's Native Races. The wild Apaches, wild from their natal hour, have a legend that the first days of the world were happy and peaceful days. Then came a great flood from which Montezuma and the Coyote alone escaped. Montezuma became then very wicked, and attempted to build a house that would reach to heaven. But the great spirit destroyed it with thunderbolts. Again, Bancroft, volume 3, page 76. The Pimas, an Indian tribe allied to the Papagos, have a peculiar flood legend. The son of the Creator was called Zucca, as possibly Zeus. An eagle prophesied the deluge to the prophet of the people three times in succession, but his warning was despised. Then in the twinkling of an eye there came a peal of thunder and an awful crash, and a green mound of water reared itself over the plain. It seemed to stand upright for a second, then, cut incessantly by the lightning, goaded on like a great beast, it flung itself upon the prophet's hut. When the morning broke there was nothing to be seen alive but one man, if indeed he were a man. Zyukka, the son of the Creator, had saved himself by floating on a ball of gum or resin. This instantaneous catastrophe reminds one forcibly of the destruction of Atlantis. Zuka killed the eagle, restored its victims to life, and repeopled the earth with them, as Deucalion repeopled the earth with the stones. End of chapter five, section thirteen, part two. Recording by Mike Harris.